Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, August 17th, 2021 at 4 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Yes, here. Mr. Boylston. Present. Mayor Petrolia. Here. Mayor. And we are going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, Mayor. please. Mayor. Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Before we do that, wait a second. We have to um, ask that uh, we have a consensus for um, the uh, vice mayor to join us by phone again. She is still out of town. Can we have a motion? Motion to approve. Passing the gavel. Um, Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Okay, so welcome, uh, Vice Mayor. And if we can stand for the pledge, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Liberty and justice for all. All right, so we're at the agenda approval point. Is there any additions, subtractions, changes? Please speak forward. Yes, sir. I would like to make a recommendation that we add to the agenda a discussion on Old School Square for 7AA. That way, public comment could be dedicated to anyone here that's not for that specific topic, and then we could open it up specifically at 7AA for discussion. No objection, but I had a question. Should we make it 4C? Because I think we should do it immediately following the public comment. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. I, yeah, I'm not uh, that open to that. We have people here who would like to speak to it, which is fine, but we're not in any position, I think, to do a um, uh, adding to agenda. So I'm, I want to hear what the people have to say, but it's not a discussion from my perspective. I don't know what your but thoughts by, are. By we're not in a position to do so, I just want to clarify that with the city attorney. Are we able to add a discussion item? We can add a discussion item, oh. sure. Yeah, but we've discussed it. So. Okay. Well, you made it seem like we're not in a position to do so. You no, no, no. I think that the, the the city and nobody had any force, you know. Uh, you know. Yeah, I can't imagine 6,000 people sign a petition and 100 show up tonight that we would want to discuss it. So. No, we, I would like to hear all, every person here who would like to speak. I do, too. And I would like to discuss it. Well, Otherwise, well, we're just going to discuss it during commission comments, and everyone's going to have to sit here and wait till the end. I do that to them. Uh, I, I, I agree. I, I would second the motion. I would say this. I was not, um, because it's not on the agenda, and I spoke to Julia today, and we got a lot of information back that shows the various things that are still not, I hate to use the word again, in compliance. Um, we, I'm not prepared to discuss it. I'm sorry, I, because it wasn't an, an item, I, I'm not prepared to have a discussion. Well, I but I would like for everybody here to get their opportunity to speak tonight. I feel, ve I feel very bad that people don't feel that they've had their opportunity and I'm, I'm absolutely willing to hear them. But it's, it's ironic because I wasn't prepared when you three brought the motion last week. I don't think Mr. Boylston well, there was There wasn't three of us excuse me, that excuse brought me, the motion. Excuse me, I'm not there. <laughs> subject, All right, so if we're gonna have that. Point, a point of order, I still have the floor, Madam Mayor. Well, first of all, I didn't recognize you, sir. So you don't have point a personal privilege. Robert's rules. Do I proceed, Madam S uh, City Attorney? First of all, there was not three people who brought the motion. I'm right. correcting you. There was one person who brought the motion. It was just stated that you're not prepared to bring it up tonight. No. You were prepared to end a 30-year relationship last week. No. Our auditor is not here. On a non-agended item. If I may. And we didn't have research. We didn't have information. We've been How getting week information. The fact is, you have an audience that if you still want to go forward with what you do, and that's your choice. I'm not saying you need to, to, to rescind what you, you voted on. However, all these people came to find out why you did what you did, and I think you owe it to them. And I, think well, I agree with Mr. Boylston. Let's add a discussion item about it. I Listen. Yeah. Thank you. One moment. So I, let me listen. explain to those who don't understand. We don't have clapping after. We're having a conversation. We're having a, a, a dialogue up here, so there's no clapping. Just if you if you want to, just do no. this so that and we can continue. Look, I appreciate everybody that came here, and I really appreciate your concerns. And I tried to answer every single email to the best of my ability. But what I will tell you 
and I'm saying this very comfortably, my understanding, there is an auditor working with Old School Square, and we are trying to get to the bottom of where they are still lacking in terms of compliance, and they are. And I would like to have that discussion once all the information is in. And, and, and I would, I would like I'm willing to do that. Let's put like that on a future agenda. that we have been served with notice that there is going to be uh, litigation as well, so I don't feel comfortable doing anything with respect to, you know, any kind. I, I don't have any problem in listening, but I don't have any right. interest in, in opening up that um, avenue. And I hope that, I don't know what our city attorney feels about that, but that's a concern of mine as well. Um, we, we were... Hey, I'm there. Hold on just a minute, ma'am. We were served with a notice Thank of you. intent to sue from the council for... Um, for Old School Square. Um, so while you know everyone is here, you can receive their comments, I, I would caution you against having a discussion. Um, I would be only be concerned about the statements that are made. You know, I, I think the commission does have the ability to speak freely without fear of um, consequences to some extent, but the fact that they are in a position to sue the city, I do think that that should be something that um, should weigh in the back of your heads when you're deciding if you want to add a discussion item. Chair recognizes uh, Commissioner, uh, I'm sorry, um, Vice Mayor Johnson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor. We have nothing on the agenda other than comments that we have been told were going to come from the public. I am not in favor of a discussion. And in lieu of the fact that uh, the organization has chosen to go the litigation route, I think we should be very cautious about anything we put on the record. I welcome comments from the public. We've been getting them on emails, phone calls, smoke signals, however they can come to us. So I would not be in favor of having a discussion by the commission. Okay. With Thank that, you. We, any other additions or deletions? Yeah, I was just, you have one meeting to reconsider that decision and I was trying to give you the opportunity, that's all. Well, I think, Great. I appreciate that. Anything else? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, Madam Mayor. Given some adjustments in the development process schedule, we are requesting to pull item D, 7D, pardon me. D as in David. 7B as in boy? D as in dog. Oh, D, thank you. Thank you. All right, any other changes? Entertain a motion. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Okay, moving on to uh, 4A, which is the presentation of our Employee of the Month, and we are going to invite uh, Lachey King up to talk to us about our employee. Hello, Mayor Commission all. It is a wonderful day in spite of everything because I get to do something exciting today. We are going to recognize the City of Delray Beach Employee of the Month. We have Laura Sins, our Finance Executive Assistant as our Employee of the Month. Can we give her a round of applause? I'm going to ask the finance director, Mr. John Leggy, to come on up and tell us all about what she did to deserve this award. John Leggy, finance director. Uh, there are many things I can say about Lauren. Lauren uh, has a lot of adjectives to describe her. She's energetic. She's, uh, she's a, a super worker. She's punctual. She's accurate. But the most important thing I can say about Lauren is she's a team player, not only in the finance department, but throughout the city. She is always willing to step up and do something for someone else. So Lauren, congratulations. This is well deserved. One of the things I think we all know is that we all have that person that's in your department or your organization that when something needs to be done, you can go to that person, step up. That person's going to get it done and get it done on time and get it done accurately, maybe without a lot of instruction. And Lauren's that person of finance director. So congratulations, Lauren. Congratulations on your award and congratulations. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> 
so although Lauren does not want to say anything, I work directly with Lauren. And when I tell you she is an absolute rock star, I am excited that I get to call on her whenever there's any issue in my department because she really knows how to fix it. So Lauren, guess what? On behalf of the city of Delray Beach, we have an employee of the month class. And guess what? You also get, honey, eight hours off with pay. Congratulations, Lauren. Thank you. Well deserved. Okay, so moving on to uh, comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda items, and um, what we're going to do is open up the floor. But I'm going to first, I'm going to give everybody some instructions because I know there's a lot of people here, maybe for the first time. So first, let me welcome everybody that's here in support of Old School Square. I know that that's the big issue. We've been receiving all of your. Um, emails and we also have received um, information that there is a petition circulating with quite a few signatures on it. Just want you all to know that I think that I, can, I speak for everybody up here that we all love um, Old School Square and we all feel that Old School Square is the heart and soul of Delray Beach. Um, I love the history of those buildings. Um, I also love um, the fact that they were restored and preserved in our ever-changing downtown something that has stayed for, you know, as long as probably anybody in this room can remember, something that's unchanged. And I also love seeing our neighbors down and, and friends down in Old School Square dancing or celebrating with music. Um, we, we celebrate the witch's ride, we celebrate the Christmas tree lighting and the menorah writing, uh, lighting. Um, we, we marvel at the, uh, the arts, and uh, we meet speakers and musicians and artists down there. And most importantly, we meet and we, you know, kind of come together. That's what our old school square is all about. So I'm with you on this issue. We must save it, not just for now, but for the generations to come. For right now, old school square means making some tough decisions. Saving it means, make, it means making some tough decisions. To save old school square for the people of Del Rey, the nonprofit management company currently in charge of Old School Square must be changed. This decision didn't get made in a rushed to judgment last week. It's a result of years of deeply concerning financial practices, violations of city approval processes, and a revolving door of fired CEOs and respected board members leaving out of concern about a nonprofit management company's practices. But please don't confuse Old School Square our old school square with the management company that shares the name and has in recent years become unfit to steward this important treasure. We will save old school square by putting its management in the skilled hands of those who not only respect its importance, but also respect their obligations to this community and the legal agreements by which they are bound. Old school square belongs to all of us. And we will, keep, we will fight to keep Old School Square the center of our community that it has become. We will do this by riding the ship and keep Old School Square on the course for all of Delray to enjoy now and in the future. For those of you who are here for the first time, please let me give you some guidance if you're planning to speak. First, you must sign in. We have a sign-in sheet at the table closest to the lectern over there. When you get to the lectern, and by the way, there's no order, you just queue up. Um, please state your name and your address and you will have up to three minutes to speak. There's a time clock right up in that corner you can watch to make sure that you're not going over or can't get, you're not getting out the most important information in time. We have a limit of one hour for public speaking, so be mindful that you, if you don't need that entire time of three minutes to say what you need to say, those at the end of the line would be grateful for your brevity. You cannot address any single person on this commission or a small group of people on the commission. You must address us as a body, boisterous and slanderous 
comments are not allowed and will be barred. You will be barred from continuing if you do that. The commission will listen to all of your comments, but we will not respond. I tell you this because many people walk out of here thinking we were being rude, but that's just the way that this works. You're to come to us and, and, and give your information or make your comments to us and we're to listen. So it's not our time to have an exchange of information. Uh, so this is your opportunity to voice your opinion or make any comments. And it doesn't have to be just Old School Square. There's probably a couple of other issues that people are here um, to talk about as well. So um, please feel free once you come forward. But I'm going to start with the city manager. He has the opportunity to be able to address any previous comments or make any comments that he would like to make at this point in time. Mr. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. And quite frankly, I'll have a couple other updates, perhaps unrelated to the not to the significant issue that's before you all relative to public input at this time. Sorry? In any event, considering the old school square issue, of course, last week was my very first meeting as your new city manager. I officially joined the organization Monday, August 2nd, 2021. So very much brand new to the organization and a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement on my part, as well as from many people in the community regarding my place in the organization and what I have to offer in terms of leadership and guidance. Interestingly enough, a significant role and function of the city manager is to accept policy direction from the board of directors, in this case being the mayor and city commission. Likewise, I have a Herculean task in terms of familiarizing myself relative to history, issues, and challenges at all levels regarding the city of Delray Beach as an operation, its various roles and functions, its related agreements, partnerships, etc. Considering the matter regarding Old School Square, as a result of last week's direction, my office had experienced a number of inquiries, questions, comments from various people from not only the corporate limits of Delray Beach but elsewhere as well. And what I found in that particular experience as of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday into the weekend up until this morning, quite frankly, were a number of people who directly reached out to me as well as other staff members concerning Old School Square and interestingly enough, a great deal of misinformation that had been perpetuated regarding this particular matter. Notable to that effect was the notion that the office of the city manager or me as your new city manager was engaged in discussions with management companies and other organizations involved or expressing an interest in this regard. My input to the Mayor and City Commission and quite frankly the public at large is before we get to a place in which we can offer the leadership and guidance to that effect, there's a tremendous number of steps that must need to be exercised in that regard. As a municipality, the city of Delray Beach must engage a number of protocols and practices before any considerations can be made with respect to proposals, opportunities, whatever the case may be. Commonplace along those lines are requests for proposals, but definitely, as an example, but definitely a definitive public and transparent process well in advance of any source of discussions, engagements, and collaborations at hand. Likewise, written commentary explaining why we are where we are and where we anticipate going does include the necessity to engage that public process. Being transparent, being open in that regard. Likewise, ladies and gentlemen, you as a board of directors are not yet in position to, to proceed with any proposal considerations because we have not yet engaged in any processes or review exercises necessary to get to that place, number one. Number two, we're talking about a considerable amount of time before the organization is able to get to that place in that regard. Likewise, to the commission, as your city manager, your chief executive officer, I promise to do my absolute utmost to ensure that we are following all proper protocols and direction with respect to any consideration that you may wish to entertain. But again, we're talking a considerable amount of time, not to mention the aforementioned concerns having been raised across the board. So I do thank you for that opportunity as well as for the clarification. That message is also for members of the concerned public, residents, stakeholders, and other constituents who may have a concern in this regard. We are nowhere near at a place in which we can offer recommendations in that regard. Again, I will work closely with the commission and any and everybody else concerned to offer step-by-step -step approaches before we can offer any direction or recommendations in that regard. This is not the place. 
this is not the time. And likewise, I look forward to being able to create the environment, working with all involved to get to that place responsibly. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that's a meaningful update to you all as you understand the facts of life in that regard. We are not in that place. And again, it will take us a considerable amount of time before we are able to get there. <laughs> so with that, Madam Mayor, thank you very much for the opportunity for clarification. Very good. Any other comments from previous um, uh, comments that you needed to follow up on, or is that it? I think that's it for the time okay. being. Thank you, ma'am. All right, very good. So um, anybody who would like to speak, you can step up, but there's only four allowed in line to keep the spacing correct and not to block the door. So if we can get four, and then what we'll do is just slowly, just as somebody comes down, you'll, you'll replace them coming up, and we'll just keep moving forward. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. I'm Tom Rutherford. I live at 3264 Lakeview Drive. I'm a neighbor of the mayor. Yes. Uh, thank you, Commission, for giving us an opportunity to respond to your actions at the last meeting. I want to tell you about my experience at Old School Square. The creative art schools there have enriched my life and opened my eyes to beauty that I used to walk by unaware. Fifteen years ago, when my wife and I began to travel more, I went to the Delray camera shop to get a nice camera. And Chris there recommended that if I wanted to learn how to use it, I go to Old School Square and take some photography classes. And that's what I did, and that's what I have been doing for 15 years. For the last two years, we've been doing it via Zoom. The photography classes are taught by some very, very skilled photographers. And some of the fellow students there are also very talented. Some of my closest friends in Delray Beach are folks I met in those classrooms. My wife and I sometimes consider moving closer to our kids in Atlanta, but I kind of get nervous every time she brings it up because I have looked and looked, and in the entire huge city of Atlanta, there's nothing like the old school square curriculum, I'm not talking about the buildings, there's nothing like it. And I, it may not exist anywhere else in, in the country. So you're meddling with, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say meddling. Uh, the commission, you are, um, you're going to have to deal with something that's rather delicate and can e isn't easily broken. I'm so grateful to the old school square that uh, it's been for me, uh, it had such a positive in impact on my quality of life. So I try to return the favor by paying for class fees, making donations, and buying tickets to shows and special events. I'm not doing this to honor the buildings or the grounds. I'm doing this to honor the people who run this wonderful facility. So here's hoping we can find a way together to revisit the regrettable decision concerning the lease. Although tonight now it sounds like that's going to be impossible. Um, but I hope we can find a fitting path forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Elise Johnson Nail, 229 Southeast 7th Avenue, Delray Beach. Ladies and gentlemen of the commission, city manager, I'm here today as a concerned citizen, donor, and your constituent. Most of you all know me and my family and what we've done for this city. Sorry, my voice is shaking. Um, but your recent vo vote to terminate the lease agreement with Old School Square gives my family and many other generous donors in this city great pause, as well as grave concerns regarding our commitment to support any nonprofit leasing from the city of Delray Beach or receiving CRA grant money. I personally feel horrible for the other not-for-profits wondering, will I be next? The commission you all voted unanimously a few weeks ago to allow Old School Square donor-funded renovations to continue to the Crest Building. The private donor of an extraordinary gift of $1.4 million to renovate and bring bathrooms and kitchens up to code spoke to you at the meeting. Old School Square is adding culinary arts to the school and a free program offering restaurant training to citizens of our community to make them more readily employed, which was an idea directly given to me by a city commissioner. None of these renovations are funded with any 
public city dollars. They're all donations. Then a few short weeks later, at another city meeting of you, you decided to end the lease with Old School Square. At this point, why would anybody donate their hard-earned money to any nonprofit organization in this city, subject to the whims of the commission, voting to spend private donors' money on improvements to city buildings, knowing that you've been thinking for years to let them go, is downright shameful. Shameful. Unjust enrichment is a term that comes to mind. I have to wonder what could possibly have changed in the short interim of the meeting before to warrant such drastic action. Phone calls are being made asking for help to raise money to restart Old School Square. What's really happening behind the scenes? As a major donor in Delray Beach, this is more than frightening. I had to turn this down, sorry. Personally, I'm unsure if you realize the enormous responsibility you've just accepted on behalf of your constituents. Old School Square operates with approximately $3.8 million budget during non-COVID times. The CRA awarded a grant of $750,000. That's less than 25% of the entire budget. The people that voted to end the lease, it takes courage, good character, and grace to admit sometimes when you've made a mistake or a hasty decision. Maybe you were ill-advised, didn't have the chance to review the submitted documents. You might have been too busy to have a roundtable discussion with Old School Square. No time for a community charrette. You must be really busy to not have time to do your diligence before making decisions on behalf of the taxpayers in Delray Beach. Collecting facts and data from everyone is basic for any decision. These decisions and the damage done may be irreversible. The impact of this will severely impact all not-for-profits in this city, not just Old School Square, but ending right now and into the future. I don't know if you'll ever be able to earn back the trust needed by donors and the voters who elected you. Where do we possibly go from here? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Linda Nail. I happen to be the sister-in-law of that wonderful woman you just heard from. Um, I don't live in Delray Beach. My address is 902 South Plus 27th Terrace in Boynton Beach. But I'm here today because I want to speak to you as a donor, a volunteer, and a patron. Since moving to Florida in 2011, um, I started taking classes at Old School Square, and they have enriched my life. I have spent, we have spent, hundreds of dollars in concert tickets, and going to, to the museum, and um, it is not affecting just the people in Delray Beach. This is far-reaching into the adjacent communities. I need to share some information or some things that uh, our family has continued and uh, contributed and donated to this city. For over a decade, uh, the family business, Putnam Around Delray Beach, has hosted hundreds of fundraisers for our community. These include schools, private citizens, not-for-profits, special causes, basically anyone who asks. And my family and the Putton staff have donated our time as well as money directly to the city of Delray Beach as well. We donate, set up, and decorate the portable mini golf holes by the 100-foot tree every single year. We actually purchased, because the city couldn't afford it, the ice skating rink for the city of Delray Beach. I personally was here um, the last uh, Christmas that we were able to and came and painted the Santa house, the gingerbread house, the Cornell um, and the uh, Cornell house for the Holiday Village. Spent hours up here painting, repainting, refurbishing those buildings for, for the uh, community. We purchased decorations and Christmas trees for the Santa house and the village when the city budget didn't allow new decorations. My brother volunteers as Santa every year and hosts a Santa party at his home offering dinner and professional Santa training to all of the volunteers. We paid a contractor to do repairs on the buildings. And our mascot, I think everybody knows Putty, uh, goes to county events to represent Delray anytime we are asked by the city representatives. When asked, we always give back to our community in time and monetary donations. In addition to my volunteer hours, uh, my family has donated an extraordinary amount of money or, uh, to numerous not-profits in Delray Beach over the past decade, including but not limited to Old School Square Center for the Arts, the Historic Society, the Arts Garage, the Library, in addition to many others not receiving CRA funding by the city, including Impact 100, the Achievement Center for Children and Families, the Bethesda Hospital Foundation, and the Sandaway House. Uh, frankly, if it were not for Francis Bork, numerous donors, volunteers, dedicated people in the Old Square 
School Square Center for the Arts, not for profit, there would be no discussion at all. There would not be a Crest Theater, Pavilion Stage, Creative Arts School, or Field House. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. I feel like I walked into a hornet's nest this afternoon. <laughs> My name is Deborah Davis Walker, and any of you that have been around more than 50 years in the Delray area or have family that have been here, you know that back in 1971, Carver High School and Seacrest High School merged to become Atlantic High School. Well, guess what? I am a member of the first graduating class of Atlantic High School. Right. And Atlantic High School, we are about to celebrate our 50th anniversary of graduating from Atlantic. So I am here today to tell, to extend an invitation to the mayor and at least one commissioner to our dinner on October 30th. We're having a weekend over the, over the Halloween weekend. We're having a weekend of events. We're going to the football game on Friday night. We're having a memorial service at Veterans Park on Saturday day. We're having a scavenger hunt after the memorial service, and we're dancing and dining the night away at the Aloft Hotel on Saturday, October 30th. And on Sunday, we'll be going to church at Lakeside Christian Church in Boynton. Those of you that know anything about Atlantic High School, uh, originally we were students from both Delray and Boynton, and we merged together to become Atlantic, so therefore we have Delray and Boynton participating. We've already spoken to the Atlantic uh, City Council, a city commission. We were not, <laughs> we did not have as many people <laughs> uh, there. But guys, we really want the city of Delray to know that we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. We're the first graduating class. We invite any of you that are interested to, to come out and participate. I have information regarding that. I just need an email address and I'll send it to you. If you have any relatives or friends that went to Atlantic High School, we certainly want to invite them and we certainly want to celebrate everything that's going on at Atlantic High School. Fantastic. And you guys will get a follow-up letter from us, Commission. Thank so you very much. It. Thank you for coming in. Yes, ma'am. Can I take my mask down? Yes, okay. Ladies and gentlemen of the City Commission, Mayor, uh, Mr. Attorney, um, my name is Melissa Schechter. Um, I am a full-time resident of Delray Beach. I reside at 237 Southeast 7th Avenue in Delray. Um, I have chosen to speak today because one of the main reasons I, I chose to move to Delray Beach from Parkland almost five years ago was for Old School Square. Um, however, this is not the reason I have chosen to leave work, um, and I do work in Fort Lauderdale, um, and uh, leave work and uh, choose to speak to you today. Uh, however, uh, I, I am here to offer my firsthand knowledge of public, private operations and fundraising for similar institutions here in Florida. I currently serve as a board member uh, on an executive committee of the Friends of Florida History. It's a 501c3, which is operated by the um, Florida Department of State. Uh, this particular entity, this 501c3, um, was put in place to manage several historic properties uh, that are owned by the state of Florida. I have been on this committee for many years and previously served on the Florida Historic Commission and as ambassador and liaison for the Florida Department of State for Viva Florida 500, which is the 500th anniversary of Florida being named uh, Florida by Ponce de Leon. Um, prior to that, I spent over 20 years chairing and fundraising millions of dollars and serving on the board of directors for the Viscayans, Viscaya Museum and Gardens in Miami. In all of these positions, I have witnessed firsthand how grassroots, community spirit, and fundraising efforts are obliterated when government entities or quasi-government management companies take over and remove the heart and soul of an organization. I have witnessed these significant impacts personally. There are millions of dollars, millions of dollars lost in event income at Vizcaya, not to mention membership declines, community and volunteerism were also significantly impacted by that decision. 
With Friends of Florida History, there has been no significant revenue generated in any meaningful way since, since its inception, and the whole purpose of its inception was to raise funds outside the taxpayer's dollar. So they have raised nothing. They are stuck in bureaucratic red tape and can get absolutely nothing done. And I still serve on this committee. Um, and this is not because these are bad people or because of any bad intentions. This is because the red tape that I just mentioned and the bureaucracy and community and giving and doing just do not function together. I, I know this firsthand. I have seen this. I have seen this over the last 20 years. I know that these type of things, well, well-intentioned and we think that a management company is going to come in and they're going to have all the answers. But when you do these things, you rip the heart and soul out of an organization which is here for our community. I urge you Thank to you, reconsider this. Thank you. Okay. I can take my mask. Yes, you may. Uh, good evening, everybody, in their respective place. I don't know everybody. My name is James McCray. I've been in Derry since 1952. So, therefore, I know a little bit about old school square and the rest of the school. But I'm not here for that. I'm not here to make a complaint. I came by to say hello, love you. But don't go, don't go nowhere. This is, I'm back. This is for the ladies of the board. Uh, nothing personal, gentlemen, nothing personal. But for you ladies doing such a great job, I would like to leave these brief flowers for y'all. I don't know how to get them to you. For the mayor, two commissions. This is for you, and thank you so much for whatever you do. You can get the work okay. to take them. Thank Bye -bye. you so Wait, much. Uh, Mayor, excuse yeah. me, James, pardon me. While you're at oh, the yes. podium, um, yeah. could I just quickly, ladies and gentlemen, I know James uh, locally, and he runs a, a chess tournament for children. Yeah. He's a lovely gentleman who uses his own funds to uh, engage children in chess. And if would you just uh, announce, since you're here, your next tournament? Yeah, uh, my name's James again, uh, James Chess Club. I try to teach chess to the community. It's open to the community. And the purpose of it is to bring us together and fulfill love. I work with young people from age 4 to 18. I also work with senior citizens, you know, a lot, a lot of us. Uh, we work right here in Derry Beach, Florida. Uh, basically, we have meetings at Old School, not Old School, Spady Museum at 170 Northwest 5th Avenue, Derry Beach, Florida. If you're interested, again, like I say, really thank you. Everybody, because whether you realize or not, you really are supporting the chess club, and the young people appreciate you. And I want to say thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, yes sir. I wish I didn't have to follow James. <laughs> <laughs> Better you than me. <laughs> you want to reset? Thank you. Um, my name is Scott Porton. I live at 112 Basin Drive. Since all of you know me, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing myself other than to uh, mention that I am a past board member of Old School Square and I've been significantly involved for more than 16 years. Uh, many of us are still in shock over the vote last week to, uh, to terminate our lease. I could stand here and go over all the reasons why you guys should try to work out your differences with Old School Square, but honestly, I don't believe this was the result of a sincere desire to do best for the citizens. Frankly, this process has done so much damage to Old School Square and the community, I don't think you can walk this back. So I'm going to let the others do that tonight. But what I would like to focus on is the process that brought us here. You decided without notice and without a conversation with Old School Square or the community to end a 30-year partnership with the city. You spent considerable time deliberating the perils of voting to evict without understanding what it is you were taking on. And then three of you took the nuclear option. I can sure tell you how it looked. Given my experiences with this organization, I am uniquely qualified to tell you you have no idea what you did. And of course you don't. You never asked anyone. The whole time I was watching the meeting, I kept saying to myself, why aren't they talking to us? Why are we being treated like adversaries? It felt awfully personal. The lack of kindness was disturbing. The vitriol coming from the vice mayor in the past few meetings was inaccurate, inappropriate, and unforgivable. Please keep, please keep it, your comments, Scott, it, to, this to applies the, to the all board. Of Sir, part, keep this, please, your, your comments are to the entire board, not this, to anyone in particular. Thank you. It was taken as a personal attack by anyone who was involved in Old School Square in its recent history and frankly has demonstrated a complete lack of understanding for the organization and those who served it. 
You could not even work up a compliment for Francis, our founder, or Margaret, the generous benefactor who donated more than $2.5 million in capital improvements to her historic buildings. What was the crime? The crime was suggesting that these improvements were anything short of one of the most generous gifts the city has ever received. There was no public outcry for you guys to do this. None of you were elected with terminating Old School Square as part of your platform. So why did this happen at the last commission meeting? I have my theories, and they are really ugly. But here's the real issue. This commission is broken. Many of the citizens have lost confidence in your ability to govern objectively. Whether it was taking back the CRA, firing the last couple city managers, or terminating Old School Square, huge decisions have been made under the most bizarre circumstances. I see a fundamental lack of humanity coming from this commission. You need to fix your own house before you start burning down others. Thank you. Listen, uh, we're, we're going to try and get through everybody talking. So if you guys do that, we're just running low on time. So I, I get it. Everybody's excited and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of emotion. But let's try to keep it down and let people talk. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Jim Chard, and I live at 401 Southeast 4th Avenue, and I'd like to tell a story of two buildings, both owned by the city, both historic. One of them is dynamic and generates arguably hundreds of millions of dollars for the city. It is active, it is involved with the community and the other not-for-profits, and it is run by a not-for-profit. That's Old School Square, Crest Theater, Cornell. The other one, also a historic building, also owned by the city, is run by the city. And it's burned down under your watch. That was the first building, the historic railroad, that everybody sees when they come off of I-95. It was already demolition by neglect. I've been through it. I saw the... the bodies that were used for practice dummies for the police and fire. I saw the beams that were hanging down. For years and years, the city neglected that. And maybe they should. I mean, I'm not trying to criticize your management versus the old school square, but I do know that Cornell and Crest are alive and they contribute to the city. And that one has literally burned down. There was no money contributed to it. It would cost, and it is going to cost you millions of dollars to repurpose that, to put personnel department in it, if they can find a way to get to it, because there isn't really an easily accessible roadway to it. The key thing here is it costs money to repurpose historic buildings. You all spent about $2 million, maybe a little bit more, to put in a roof and, and air conditioning, because that's your responsibility. It's your building. But meanwhile, millions and millions of dollars have been devoted by residents, by donors, to redo the inside and to keep it so it doesn't burn down, like the one under your management burned down. My point here is not to criticize you, but to point out how difficult it is to raise the money, to support the building, to keep it alive, to keep it fireproof, to have the sentry cameras outside to make sure that people don't come in and to cause it to be burned down. That could have been the gateway to our city in terms of all sorts of different uses. Right now, it's a burned out hulk under your watch. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. My name is David Schmidt. I'm here tonight to speak to you in my capacity as president of the Delray Beach Chamber of Commerce. I have a statement uh, to read on behalf of the board of directors. For 30 years, Old School Square has been an integral part of our community. It helped spur the revitalization of a dying downtown. It has provided an entertainment and cultural venue unparalleled in South Florida. It has been a haven of arts, culture, and connection for countless local and visiting families. It has had a tremendous economic impact on our business community as patrons and guests have stayed in our local hotels, 
dined in our local restaurants, and shopped in our local stores. In short, Old School Square has been the heart of Delray Beach. Old School Square is a shining example of the power of people working together, the sort of collaborative problem-solving initiative that the residents and government of this city can be proud of. Together, the residents in the city took an abandoned, rundown eyesore in the heart of the city and transformed it into the heart of the community. It is just one example of residents in the city commission and staff joining forces to recognize a problem as a promise in disguise. We collectively turned an issue into an opportunity through unity and creativity. In the process, it not only enlivened our identity as a community, but became the pride of that identity because it was something that we, all of us, had built together. It is clear that there are challenges at Old School Square. What nonprofit or city government, for that matter, has not had its share? But in the past, when other nonprofit organizations so central to our community faced struggles, the city worked with those organizations to solve the problems instead of cutting ties. I've referred to Old School Square as the heart of the city. Hearts can become ill and require treatment, but it's rare when a heart needs to be completely removed and replaced. Instead of treating the ailments with the organization, which appear to be more than treatable, the city commission has chosen to give Old School Square a transplant. Unfortunately, this is another example of decisions being made by emotion. Votes are being made based on personality and not policy, and it was made without any prior notice to the public. Management at Old School Square can be fixed. Let us fix it together. This is the perfect opportunity for the city to utilize the collaborative process that has worked so well in the past to right the ship. A task force could be established to work with management at Old School Square to transform its issues into opportunities once more, and the Chamber of Commerce is more than willing to participate in that process and help to heal the heart of our city. A heart that has given so much to us and now simply needs our care in return. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the Greater Delray Beach Chamber of Commerce, I would urge the Commission to vote tonight to rescind the motion to terminate the lease with Old School Square Center for the Arts, Inc. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Rob Long. I live at 2962 Calabria Way, Delray Beach. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Welcome to the fray, Mr. Moore. I'm a 12-year resident of Delray Beach. I spent the last six consecutive years serving on volunteer advisory boards with the city. I'm currently on my second term of Planning and Zoning Board. I say that to emphasize my commitment to Delray Beach and everything it has to offer and to share my complete disapproval of the unwarranted attack on our volunteer class last week. People who give their time, money, and loyalty to this city, really the heart and soul of our city, are being singled out, denigrated, and disrespected by certain political elements here. It's hard to fathom that this commission terminated Old School Square's lease after a 30-year run with no agenda item, no staff presentation on the data, no chance for Old School Square to defend themselves, and no notice to the public. Most of the discussion on this item was frankly emotional and hyperbolic. Valid reasons weren't really presented, and the way the discussion was brought forth felt very personal. I'm not here to condone the mistakes that were made by Old School Square Board. Those should be addressed, but there should be a good faith effort to resolve this issue, like responsible public officials and professionals would do. For instance, scheduling a public notice workshop with facts and research that allows the public to engage in a discussion with the nonprofit whose lease you just voted to terminate. This rastish decision leaves us all asking, was there any vision in mind for an alternative future for Old School Square? Was there any analysis of the consequences of this termination? This will have a major impact on Delray Beach. Old School Square is a major cultural hub for both residents and visitors. And why pick this fight now? especially when Old School Square just produced its biggest concert ever, the Jimmy Buffett one, are there not enough other issues with the city right now? The unfilled positions, for instance, the Delta variant surge, while we're all wearing masks tonight, the numerous lawsuits the city is embroiled in currently, the budget that needs adoption, the new city manager. For, like, this felt opportunistic and irresponsible, and we deserve better. It's not too late to rescind this and reconsider. Six, over 6,100 people signed a petition within a week, so that should be a signal maybe to reconsider. It's not capitulation to rescind this. It's being a responsive public official. 
And Mr. Moore, I apologize, this is your first intro to our fair city. And I urge you not to distance yourself from the culture of toxic vendettas and petty reprisals embodied by several members of this commission. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, all. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm going to be short and brief. My name is Jason Tomlin. I have lived in Delray Beach for the last 35 years. And uh, when I first came to this town, the only place that was open was Arcade Tap Room, a restaurant on Atlantic Avenue. Everything else was deserted. And then 30 years ago, Old School Square was founded, and they developed the heart of the city. Old School Square brings thousands of people on a monthly basis to this town not just to go and see the venues, the events, the great events that they put on. And when they first started, they started with small events. They developed in this giant, glamorous organization that brings thousands of people to the city. They spend money in restaurants. They walk around. They go into shops. That's what attracts people to Old School Square and the city. So when I heard about one of you on, uh, on the committee say, I know you're all excited to be here. I'm not excited to be here. I quite frankly, I'm really disappointed with the decision that a few of you made behind the curtains. It wasn't even an agenda item. And to me, like previous people said up here, sit down with the people, have a discussion, be adults, and not just make a quick rash decision that affects the entire city. And I can guarantee you, I will not donate to a management company. I mean, who wants to do that? I donate to people that I love, that I care for, that do a great job and develop this old school square. With that said, thank you, please reconsider. And I really think this was a, um, a rash decision that a few of you made and hopefully you have the decency and the humanity to reconsider. Thank yes, you. Sir. Good afternoon, my name is Steve English. I live at 102 Northeast 10th Avenue. And I echo all the previous comments made in regards to the ill-mannered and just absolutely ill-timed consideration of the economic gut punch that you have given to this city and to the nonprofits that actually benefit from Old School Square. I've had the privilege to work with them on four occasions, bringing four major events close to 1,000 people each time in support of new nonprofits here. You've eradicated that with one decision. And then to have used that same rationale to not even open it up for discussion this evening is appalling. That you're giving us one hour to voice concerns with no remediation is, frankly, welcome to our city. This is what you can expect. And one of the other items, no one has ever put forth what I've seen in any of this analysis is what is the positive economic impact that has been shepherded through this organization's 30-year tenure. Does anyone have an answer for that? Or should that have been a discussion item that should have been done before doing this type of an action that has consequences? That building will stay empty for years before it becomes fully functional. And just as was said, it will probably be left to disrepair in other types of negotiated contracts that don't seem very apparent. And I will offer a little correction to our new city mayor, is the fact that the comments that were made about conversations about management companies was not directed towards you. It was from other members of this commission which stated on the record that they've had these conversations. It smells dirty, smells nasty, and I think you all need to back it up a little bit and let the citizens have a voice because it's our property, not yours. Hi, my name is Deborah Tendrich, and I'm here as a local nonprofit called Eat Better, Live Better. We're located at 14451 South Military Trail. And running a nonprofit during a pandemic is very hard. Running a nonprofit in general is very hard. Uh, I have talked and worked with and collaborated with many nonprofits in the city. And one thing we all agree on is that the city isn't very supportive of the local nonprofits. We've delivered about a half a million pounds of groceries to our residents here in Delray Beach. And not one commissioner has called and said thank you, offered a helping hand, along with others who help with housing, food, rent assistance. And on behalf of a nonprofit, not having the opportunity to remedy any mistakes 
that they have made or that you feel unfit is not right. You know, old school square management, we're not here to visit the buildings. Yes, the buildings are amazing, but the programs, the staff, everyone, they collaborate with so many businesses, they collaborate with other nonprofits. Those relationships that they have built and established in the community are priceless. No management team that can come in and take over will be able to recreate those relationships that have taken years to establish. <laughs> Nonprofit work is more than just showing up and doing your job. It's relationships, it's caring, it's putting your time, your own money, your own commitment into the community because you care so much. A management, for-profit management team or another nonprofit who doesn't have their footwork already in Delray Beach will not offer the same amount to the community as what we already have here. If, I'm actually very disappointed and I can't imagine any of you who have never made a business decision that you didn't have an opportunity to remedy without getting the rug pulled under you and never had a chance to come back from it. And with that being said, I really hope you all take consideration all the relationships, the programs, the collaboration that Old School offers, and really reconsider and give them another chance to remedy any inconsistencies or any concerns you have. Because working together, the village by the sea, that's our platform. That's what we're here for, is to collaborate, work together, and do the best thing for the city. And um, so I really do hope you all reconsider your position on this. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kathy Witt, 202 Northeast 5th Terrace. And I'm here because I love Old School Square. And I watched that meeting last Tuesday while I was streaming it, and I couldn't believe, I hope I can get through this without crying. It broke my heart. I've been like, sick ever since I watched that vote go down. Um, I bought my house seven years ago, and it was in large part because of Old School Square. I wanted to live in Delray Beach. There are lots of other cities with beaches and restaurants, but Old School Square is what makes us all American city. Uh, it's very special. And I just want to implore you to reconsider and don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm Mavis Benson, 800 Greenswood Court. I work downtown. I have a business downtown. I co-chair the Downtown Merchant and Business Association, and I'm on the DDA board. Good afternoon, city manager, mayor, and commissioners. As a city, we find ourselves in a very difficult, delicate, and most unfortunate situation. We are all very passionate about this beloved landmark. Old School Square is an institution, a landmark, a hub of our community, and a centerpiece of our downtown. As a downtown placement management organization, the DDA board and team offers its support to the city and to the Old School Square Center for the Arts as discussions and considerations move forward regarding this vital entity and treasure which holds so much potential and serves as an economic driver in our city. In so doing, we request inclusivity and discussion concerning any path in moving forward. And I would request that the DDA be a part of this conversation and planning for this important time of the year. It is crucial that together we're all working on the same page with the shared mission of doing what results for the good of our community. Thank you for your continued service and consideration. Thank you, Mavis. Anyone else? <coughs> Is there anyone else? Is there Keith? Yeah. We got six people there. Okay. Yeah. Three at a time. Three. Joe, you yeah. come with me? Sure. I'll come. Good. Go on up. You want to speak? Mm -hmm. I'll be quick, Joe. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. 
Billy Himmelrich. I own the Old School Bakery. I own the property adjacent to Old School Square. I've lived here 22 years. Um, I'm a past board member. I filled a, filled a full six-year term. I love Old School Square, as all of you, I'm sure, do. Um, I will just ask you, please, to reconsider in the light of your fiscal responsibility, the oath that you have taken to the city, because you are exposing the city again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm Joe Gilley. I'm the former president and CEO of Old School Square for 23 years. I want to thank you. I'm here tonight to support you. You. Are you surprised? Well, you shouldn't be, because this is right where I need to be, is right here with you. Right here with you. It's where I belong. For 23 years, I worked and partnered with eight mayors, over 50 commissioners, four city managers, imagine that, and an incredible assistant city manager. And not once, not once was I accused of corruption or mismanagement or lack of diversity until now, six years after I have left that position. Something's wrong. Something is wrong. And I know that you know that in your heart and in your minds that something is wrong. And I'm here to support you because I believe that you know in your hearts and minds that this is wrong. I know there's challenges right now. I know we had challenges, but guess what? We had commissioners, we had mayors, we had city staff, we had board members, we had staff at Old School Square, and we got through these problems and issues because we cared about the community. And that's the bottom line here. I truly believe that Old School Square is the best uh, group of people that ran it. And they understand it. And they were all committed to this community, every one of them. Just like you're committed to this community. So I support you tonight, again, because I believe in you. And I think you'll make the right choice, like so many before you have done and so many that will do after you. I know they will. You need to put Old School Square back where it belongs. And together we can meet all these challenges. I'm proud of our legacy. There are tens of thousands of people, now millions of people that have stepped on that site at Old School Square for cultural activities. You know what's most important to me? The children. That's where we've made the difference in this community. The children's whose lives we've touched, that may have never got the opportunity to have an arts experience. That's what we're about. I'm proud of that legacy, and I'm proud of our partnership. I support you tonight, because I know you'll do the right thing. Thank you. Put all schools yeah. square back. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jason Tomaszewski, and uh, I am a 15-year employee of Old School Square. Uh, I am the head of production, and I thought I would just take this moment to just give you sort of my viewpoint of what our experience has been in this relationship. Um, I can tell you first and foremost that every request from the city has been granted and has been executed with 150% of Old School Square's passion, We've given you everything that you've asked for and have wanted and have always had our space open to you. Next question that I have is I mentioned, I heard earlier that one of the problems was turnover in CEOs. One question that I have is what about your turnover with city managers? <laughs> also, one of the reasons why we're here is because of an alleged failure on the behalf of Old School Square. Well, what about some of the failures from the city? A couple years ago, we were granted with a wonderful renovation to our buildings that included new roofs, new air conditionings, 
And I am very happy to report that the roofs still leak. The air conditionings do not work. The electrical that is outside is failing and has also been a problem that I've had to come behind and fix so nobody gets hurt. Also, there are trees that we repeatedly had asked to be cleaned because they are a liability to not only our patrons, but also the residents of City of Delray Beach who communicate and commune on our grounds. Okay, these have been requests that I personally have made and have not been met. So all I have to do is say, and get on record, whoever comes in, that they know that they will have a city that really does not have their interest in part. And also that the poor residents of Delray Beach, if they experience your services, like you've serviced Old School Square, they're in for a rough couple of years. Thank you. <clears throat> Afternoon, Chuck Halberg, 120 Northwest 4th Avenue, Delray Beach, 30-plus uh, year resident. Uh, proud to have served on five city boards in my 30-plus years here, and uh, my family has served on quite a few of the nonprofits, and we've given a dollar or two. Um, I really appreciate all the comments, and I, I just want to talk about a little history. It wasn't a few years back when the Spady Museum had some issues with audits and things, and the commission worked it out with them. It was five years ago when Mayor Glickstein said to the Arch Garage, get your act together or else, and we did. I am baffled that at a meeting last week, which was to talk about an audit, turned into a canceling of the lease, took place. Yet it can't be discussed tonight, but it was last week. Um, my last comment is, and somebody touched on it, in the mayor's opening comments, she did mention about the turnover of the staff and the board. I say the same thing. You guys should be looking in the mirror, holding yourself accountable. There's been more turnover in the last eight years here, from my background checking, of staff and city managers, and it's disgraceful. We need to come together and save Old School Square with the current leadership that's there. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Nancy Stewart. I live at 227 South Swinton Avenue. I've been a resident, a business owner, and a volunteer for over 25 years in Delray Beach. In spite of all the challenges and changes I've seen, I still love Delray Beach and call it my home. I launched an advertising agency in Delray about 33 years ago, that, and about 24 years ago found my passion in the event industry. I launched a nonprofit and four events, which are now internationally award-winning, at Old School Square, and I have run the Delray Affair for the past 16 years. These events are now produced in other cities and not in my home of Delray Beach. I was in a similar position, this position, about 10 years ago when the Garlic Fest was forced to leave its home at Old School Square. At that time, we had over 300 people show up for public comments in support of our event and all the major media partners. I continue they ask, get asked on an annual basis to please bring Gar Garlic Fest back to Old School Square. Old School Square is the heart of Delray. I'm here to beg you because, to reconsider your decision and let's do what we always used to do. Let's unite as a community and figure out a solution. We made Delray Beach a tourist destination and we can do this together too. Hi, I'm Allie Kaufman. I live at 110 Marine Way uh, in Delray. I also own Space of Mind, which is directly across the street from here at City Hall and directly across the street from Old School Square. And as Joe Gilley beautifully stated, um, standing up for the children, that's my job. So I'm here tonight representing not just my students, but all of the students that are in the Delray and surrounding areas. We use Old School Square and all of downtown Delray as the extended classroom for my students at Space of Mind, and we have enriched them through the enriching programs that are hosted there. And we have been blessed with the incredible care that has been given to us by the team um, who has worked at Old School Square with so much pride. And it's been incredible to hold our graduations there every year and to um, bring our kids to the Cornell Museum and to use the Crest Theater and to use the fitness field at Old School Square Lawn. And I would be really remiss to tell you how much that would hurt for our students to know that this was taken away from them. On that note, I wanted to share with you what is at the crux of the social, emotional, and life skill curriculum that we teach. Maybe you need a reminder. 
The four agreements are stated. Number one, be impeccable with your word. Number two, don't take anything personally. Number three, don't make assumptions. And number four, always do your best. When we teach our children that they may not have done their best, but there's always an opportunity to repair what has been broken. We sit down and we talk it through. I encourage you as a commission to do as we teach our children to do. Admit when you've made a mistake and sit down and talk it through. Humility is always the best assertive approach. Thank you so much. Thank you. Chair, may I? Excuse me. I think we're coming on the hour. Can I just make a motion for us to hear the last few people that want to speak so that uh, everybody gets their voice heard? Thank you. Oh, uh, good, e good evening. Um, my name is uh, Nancy. Nancy. Could you just wait oh, one I'm moment? Sorry. I'm sorry. You have to make the motion. I, uh, yeah, I, uh, Mayor, excuse me. You were I didn't hear you. I was saying we were coming upon the hour, and I know that we typically have, we've limited uh, I to have an hour. I have 10 minutes left. Oh, you do? I yeah. Thought, okay, I apologize. I made a motion. A so we'll see. There's a motion and a second. Oh, I didn't okay. even hear it. What was it? To uh, allow the remaining individuals to speak this okay, evening. Okay, so. Um, People feel they haven't been heard. How many more do we have to speak? Let's look at that first. Is there a line? Yeah. Anybody else in here want to speak? Raise your hand. I think we have two people. I thought we were two. Okay, that's fine. We're gonna we're gonna make it. So that's fine. Go okay, right ahead. Thank you. All right. Pardon me for interrupting. Um, my name is Nancy Channon. I live at 200 Northeast Second Avenue, and I was gonna prepare remarks, but I had a family crisis today, and for now everything's kind of at bay. And you know, it made me think that Delray is like my family too. And um, you know, it was, it was a rough day. I mean, there was arguing and fighting, uh, somebody's sick. And you know, I think the messages of unity and trying to work things out, and I know that's what I expressed in my emails to you. Um, I really love this city. I'm, um, I'm on two of the boards of two nonprofits here and the boards of two nonprofits in neighboring cities. Um, this is my second city advisory board. I'm starting on the green board this month. Thank you for having me. And I really care about this city. I know that mistakes were made, but as I said in my email, I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. We have a good thing going here. And I've, I was one of the boards I'm on almost went under in like the two, the aughts, I guess they're called. Um, and I remember speaking, I was president at the time, and I remember speaking before the city commission, and we worked it out. And I really hope that we can work this out. I really do. I know I was at the meeting, the CRA workshop in mid-July. I heard some of the things that were wrong, and I understand that. So I'm not saying, you know, everything's fine, and there's a bad guy and a good guy. I just really hope we can come together and keep old school square going they've done some they've made some mistakes but they've also been phenomenal especially during the pandemic so thank you very much thank you yes ma'am hello thanks for having me today my name is melinda webster i have been a resident of delray beach for about 10 years now but i have worked in delray beach for about 15 years. Uh, I work at Zapatel Law Firm in uh, Pineapple Grove, and Mr. Zapatel and his wife have been big supporters of Old School Square, and we have, as an office, donated money, time, energy, and the people have been nothing but wonderful. I feel like when you say Old School Square is not Old School Square, the nonprofit, I think that's doing a disservice to the people that have been doing this for 30 years. I think they are the heart and soul of Old School Square. They're the reason why it is as successful as it is. They're the reason why a benefactor donates $1.4 million to help renovate a, a theater. They're also why Jimmy Buffett comes and brings tons of revenue to downtown Delray. Um, I think not looking back and saying that maybe we acted a little bit too harshly and a little bit too quickly um, and look at this again and maybe take a new vote is really doing a disservice to the city, and I hope you can reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. 
Hello, uh, my name is Kenny Mikey. I actually am not a resident of Delray, uh, but uh, I got married at Old School Square uh, 20 years ago. Um, and actually, uh, this past couple years, I've had the opportunity to produce uh, children's television in Old School Square on the stage and in a studio there and be able to distribute it across the nation. Um, and, 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 and other people had turned me down when I, when I asked them if I could do it in, in, in some of their spaces because I know theaters nationwide are shuddering. My friends, my performer friends, my theater friends uh, are, are, are not able to work. They've been on unemployment for years, be, for the past couple years because of this. Theaters are closing down nationwide, and these people are killing it. They're rock stars. They're... They're doing so. You don't, you don't fire the gold medalists. You don't fire the people that are doing the best job. Attendance is up. Uh, uh, the, the ticket sales are up. Donations are up. The place looks great. What other reason would you have to fight? They're not doing a bad job. They're killing it. The and the only other reason that I can see, and I think other people have definitely seen as well, that you guys want to change management is because somebody else wants a piece of that success that they've built over the past 30 years. Yes, ma'am. Wow. <laughs> um, Hard to my follow. Name is Carolyn Covert. I'm a local artist, I live in town, and I've been at Old School Square for many events. I moved here because the town had character. Old School Square reminds me of my New England roots, and I thought, this is solid, this is good. And then all the activities they have there, as everyone has said, the children, the theater, the arts have expanded, and you can judge a culture by its arts by its culture, by the priority of that culture. And I'm beginning to see Delray Beach as a big money-making proposition, as I see many historical buildings, homes uh, that I've cherished driving by, and now I see Old School Square. And, and I'm wondering, is there a hidden agenda somewhere here? Because we're all loving it, we all, when I went into town, I was fundraising for a play near Palm Beach, and I went to all the restaurants in town. And when I said Old School Square, they said, sure, here's free meals, here's this, here's that. Old School Square has a tremendous amount of clout in Palm Beach County and beyond. And it would just be such a sad situation to see that change, to see that ending. And I beg of you, to look at the long term and the history of our town so that you don't have regrets with your vote. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everybody. Laura Simon with the Downtown Development Authority and uh, fourth generation Delrayian, Delrabian, I guess, if you will, native to the town. Um, I wasn't actually going to say anything tonight. Um, Mavis is speaking on behalf of the DDA, but I wanted just to, the, we need to bring the unity back in community. So this organization, um, the city, 30 plus years ago, almost 40 years ago, when downtown, when was, downtown was being revitalized, when there was a chain link fence around the old school square, the community came together to save this. So tonight I just ask that we go back and just throughout this process and after being part of the process last week, when at the end of the commission meeting, it was decided from you all to do a charrette with some of our architects and other stakeholders around the green um, changes and our green ordinance. I would just ask that we go back to that and just, you know, we've, you know we all want to be part of this, this um, thriving community and part of the process. And I think that's what we hear now is that there's not a part of, they're not, we're not a part of the process when these decisions are made. So we just ask that we, as we move forward and we continue to work with all organizations uh, that within our city and within our downtown that are vital, every piece is a part of what makes our town successful. So cutting one piece out of it or changing one, you know, whether it's private or public or it's just, it, it impacts us and it makes it even more difficult to overcome. So just include inclusive, inclusivity, 
uh, making us part of, you know, continuing that history, as Deborah said, we're our village. I think the Village by the Sea brand was actually generated out of some collaborations at Old School Square and with our community. So just continuing to keep that and be mindful that it is important for us all to work together, uh, especially now. We've done such a great job of doing that over these many, many years and making our ancestors proud in this legacy that we have and continuing to do that and I implore the Old School Square um, board and members and organizations to continue to just reach out and be inclusive as well with all of us that are here as part of that process too so thank you thank you okay anyone else if you're going to come up please come up and line up so that we don't Sorry. have to wait. Nor go. Noreen Payne, um, 222 Kingsland, Delray Beach. Um, been a resident in Delray since 1995, 96. Both my children were born here locally and have literally grown up around Old School Square. And like we all keep saying, I mean, this Old School Square is why a lot of us choose to live here. Um, you know, public comments, any one of us could have gotten up and spoken today in favor or not in favor of the vote that was that was done last week. So with with the petitions and and, and the and, and all of us coming forward and imploring you, I, I I'm so hoping like like everyone has been saying to, to put the unity back in community, please. And let's come to the table and have a conversation. In public comments, like I keep saying, we all had the opportunity to come up and speak. There could have been some comments that might have been made in favor of the vote that was done and I don't know that we heard that today or I haven't necessarily seen that as 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 passionately as I've been seeing the ones pro um, having the conversation so I don't want to take up too much more time I just wanted to point that fact out that it's that that to please come back and, and reconsider your decision and let's have the conversation together thank you thanks anyone else Seeing no one, um, public comment is closed. We did that in good time, guys. Um, all right, moving on in our agenda. I'll give a moment for everybody to leave that wants to leave. We're going to be doing our regular agenda. At this point, if there is anybody up here that would like to go ahead and make a motion for the consent agenda, as, as, I think there was an amendment on it. Um, I'll, I'll entertain that. Motion to approve. Uh, I didn't hear you. I had a, I gave a motion to approve. Okay, yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's the mask. Is there a second? Second. All right. Call the roll, Madam Clerk. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Okay, so that brings us to 7A, and we have quasi-judicial um, uh, hearings for 7A, 7B, 7C. D has been removed. So all three of those um, items, I'm going to read the quasi-judicial rules into the record. This hearing shall be conducted in accordance with quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be permitted to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a maximum of six minutes if the person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission staff and the applicant will be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city and the applicant will be allowed, offered, uh, allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon personal views, such as whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. At this point, if there's anybody here that will be um, speaking to 7A, 7B, or 7C, please stand and raise your hand and be sworn in. Okay, and so I believe 7A and B are together, is that correct? No. No? Oh, they're not. They're the same type of waiver, but different. Sorry, um, thank you very much for that. Okay, so on 7A, resolution 109-21, is there any ex parte communication that needs to be disclosed? We'll start with uh, uh, Commissioner Boylston. No. 
Okay, Commissioner for, um, Cassell. Um, I spoke to the applicant, but not on this particular subject matter, just in the past regarding this project. And I wouldn't reply. Um, None. Deputy Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor. None, unless there's something on the, the uh, server. And I, and I agree. I, I, have, um, I think I have spoken to the uh, applicant um, on the, this is the one on George Bush, so yes. Um, so that would be, my disclosure is with the uh, applicant. Um, so at this point, we're gonna have the uh, city staff enter the file into the record. Good evening, Anthea Genotis, Development Services Director for the record. Um, this is file number 2021-193. It is a waiver related to the temporary signage and the applicant is here with the presentation, I believe. Very good. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the commission. Christopher Bernardo on behalf of the applicant, and I'm gonna steal a few of the slides off of the city's slide. If we could put um, slide four up, which is the, uh, there you go, back one, please. Uh, the, the survey, back uh, one more, please. Are you going the wrong direction? There you go, <laughs> that's it. Okay. We're here on uh, the property is 1177 George Bush Boulevard. This property is currently uh, site plan approved for construction of a 16 unit uh, condominium three story complex. Uh, at issue tonight is uh, a temporary signage requirement along George Bush Boulevard. And by the red line, it shows you the, the line of consideration here that we're talking about. This is approximately 575 feet of what is currently uh, a fence and construction site, uh, site screening. Uh, the purpose of that fence, as we all know, is to uh, conceal the uh, activities behind, which is currently an active construction site. The site has been cleared of the existing uh, complex uh, that was there, and it is vacant and construction is to, is to commence very soon. So what is at issue here is that site screening and signage that is on the site screening. And, and the request we're making tonight is a waiver of the general signage criteria found in uh, LDR 467, which identifies the temporary identification signs for the city. And those are essentially that there's one freestanding sign, one sign per street frontage, non-illuminated, with a sign area of not more than 32 square feet and not more than seven feet in height. So first, the commission is obviously aware of the main purposes of the land development res regulations. And essentially what we're here for is to promote public appearance, comfort, convenience, general well welfare, and good order. Those are from 1.4. And, and that's the purpose of the waiver provision that's under consideration here. The waiver provision is a tool by this commission to permit uh, a waiver of any specific development regulation where the intent of these LDRs are not met. And here, this is precisely uh, what is at issue at 1177. When you apply the temporary signage requirement to the fence screening and construction site at 1177, the criteria at issue is, is misapplied and uh, its needs and objectives are not met at the, at the site. A waiver is appropriate in this, in this situation. So let's look at uh, what we have at 1177. Along that, uh, along that fence, which is again, it's 575 square feet, or 575 <laughs> linear feet, which is the important issue here. We have a significant portion of George Bush Boulevard and a rather odd, by the picture, a rather odd shaped, odd shaped lot. And on that, on that uh, stretch is pre-printed logos of site, site screening uh, presenting a very large corridor. If we could go to the next slide, please, you'll see what we're talking about. Very presentable site screening with the logos of the builder. Also at issue are, are several traffic and directional indicators of hours of operation, parking lot access to the building. These are not temporary identification signs, but rather a directional indicator, visual aesthetics for what is a very large portion of George Bush Boulevard. There is not a freestanding sign that issued, again, these are pre-printed logos on, on the site screen. 
that rather this site screening serves uh, the purpose of safety and visual aesthetics to the property and conceals the site of construction behind the signage. So to apply this to the construction site, what are we going to look for? We're going to look at some, some similar aspects. And, and although this property is not in the Downtown Development Authority, the D Downtown Development Authority is currently supporting and encouraging a more visual interest on fencing surrounding construction sites, precisely what we have here. In fact, the next item of the agenda is not my client, is another construction site in the city with the same issue. So for a waiver, what do you have to consider? First, you have to decide if the waiver and applicability of the current site screening, does it adversely affect the neighboring area? The question is no. In fact, it improves the neighboring area. It gives information for the access to the lot. It blocks a unsightly construction site. It ensures the safety of debris and wind. It serves a very good public purpose at the site. Number two, the requested waiver does not diminish the, the provision of public utilities. In fact, it provides a good one. And it's, in essence, the misapplication of the, the, the LDR rule here. There's no unsafe condition uh, created, which is the third criteria. Does the requested waiver create an unsafe condition? The answer is no. In fact, again, as explained, it serves a safety feature of the site. And finally, Will the requested waiver result in the grant of a special privilege in that the same waiver would be granted under similar circumstances on other property for another applicant of owner? Well, we only need to look at our agenda tonight. We have two. And we only need to look at the Downtown Development Authority, which is supporting just these types of more presentable sites at, uh, at many of the construction sites in town. There's no special privilege being granted to the applicant here. In fact, there's been at least three other projects over the years for this same developer having very similar site screening at their site. So we're going to ask again that the waiver be granted uh, and that the very visually appealing uh, site screening be allowed. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anthea? Start again. <laughs> Okay. So um, there, we did actually, we do have two waivers on tonight's agenda, and um, usually when we see multiple waivers to the same site plan or to the same section of the code, it tells us that we need to maybe look at that section of the code based on the decisions that the board makes. So I would ask maybe at the end of these two items if maybe there's some direction that we want to have provided to us. Um, so again, this is for 1177 Modern, which is the SAD that was recently approved um, to redevelop the site on George Bush Boulevard. Um, we do not have a provision for construction, fencing, graphics, or signage in the code. Um, you are required to have the mesh that does all of those good things that the applicant cited. Um, however, you know, limitations on signage are intended to keep sign litter and proliferation of, of advertisement from popping up in what could be residential districts. There's reasons why it's limited. Our code only has this one provision for temporary signage, which assumes that it's going to be a freestanding sign on a post telling you about a development that is forthcoming. And um, what we have seen in the past are um, Waivers have been granted, allowing some level of logos. Um, you know, people are interested in what the building that is forthcoming is going to look like, and so different things like that have been um, approved. So this logo here, identifying the builder, has been approved for this same builder on multiple projects three times already. And you know, we we need to either change the code or stop making them come through the process because it has been repeatedly approved. I think the bigger question as we look towards the code is how many of these types of advertisements and the quantity and size of the signage um, do we want to have showing along the side the balance between providing great information and possibly having some sign letter. So that's what we need to look at moving forward. Um, but in the meantime, um, this particular project is not within the boundaries of the downtown. The DDA has also reached out to us with a desire to improve the visual um, appearance of construction sites downtown with graphics, whether they're historical pictures 
or how much of it is advertising the architect, builders, or project forthcoming, I think is the balance that we need to find. Um, so the proposals are coming to you individually until the code can be updated to reflect that. So in this case, the um, waiver findings for you are that it's not gonna have a negative effect on the neighboring area, uh, that it doesn't significantly diminish or affect public facilities um, or create an unsafe situation. And, and is it a special privilege in that the same waiver would be granted? Um, so ultimately the considerations before you are that um, in this particular case, there's no uh, visual impact to drivers or pedestrians or anything that we can see through an evaluation of the request. Um, and then, um, I think I've said all of this already. So at any rate, so currently any graphics on construction signage, we have interpreted that freestanding code to sort of be the guide for the amount that's prop proper, that is appropriate, one per street, sign, for street, street frontage. In this case, it's a very long street frontage and there's only one on the site as opposed to a, the same type of frontage that might have been shared on multiple right-of-ways as well. So that concludes my input onto the, your consideration. If you have any questions, I'm here, of course. Thank very you. good. Thank you very much, uh, Anthea. So at this point in time, we're going to open it up to public comment. Anybody who would like to speak to Resolution 109-21, please step forward. Seeing no one, public comment on this item is closed, and we are going to go back to the applicant and the staff to ask if there is any cross-examination or any rebuttal testimony. Staff, none? and none for the applicant. Very good, to the commission. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. I like the screening in front of the construction site. Frankly, I just think it is a nicer, cleaner look. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily have a problem with putting the name of the um, site and a number to call because people driving by might necessarily want to purchase or inquire. I guess my only question is that's a really long space. How many signs beside the logo will, I mean, I imagine it'll, I guess what I'm trying to say is I'd like it to be tasteful <laughs> and I imagine it will be, but I think that um, depends on how many signs you have. There's really only the one road coming out, so presumably there maybe, and then people driving by. So will you have two signs that give the name and the phone number? Did we see? Did we see what we would be seeing there? I saw the you, both both ends, and so is that what actually is going to be there? I think the important that's there currently. The the pictures mm -hmm. that you saw. Right. So first of all, maybe to help in reference, it's every one hundred feet. Oh, okay. Is a, it, it, they're they're not crowded. The I think the important issue, which I tried to make clear on the presentation, was that we have a very odd shaped lot, and I think that right. last picture, if you go back right there, is a good look of the continuation of the signage. This is a very odd shaped space and 575 feet is a lot of space. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, so this is not your normal frontage where you have a crowded bunch of pictures. There are uh, just a few of those signs at the entrance, which would okay. be considered this, the, the informational signs of direction and access. And then you have the Seaside Builders logo, which is uh, every 100 feet. But okay. Again, it's 575 feet, um, but by the look of, I think this picture gives you the best aspect of the way it looks throughout. It is not overcrowded. It's just a very, very large uh, space. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? May yes, ma'am. Mayor? Yes. I'd like to say that I love the color. Um, a lot of them are green screened and my I have two concerns, that there not be too many multiple repetitions of the sign. Um, I don't know what's good, what's bad. Visually, it's difficult to tell just by the, the graphic that's being shown to us. Um, definitely, you would want an entryway if you can't figure that out for yourself. But my other concern is that the screening be very monitored by the um, code enforcement, because I think the screenings go up and no one attends to them, weather warned, sun warned, whatever. And these developments usually take more than a couple of years, sometimes, hopefully less for this developer. But those are my concerns that once you start putting up screening and, and lettering and signage, et cetera, and then the sun deterioration, very close to the ocean. I don't know what different aspects 
would affect the screening, but those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. I think, Commissioner? Um, if I may, I would like to just mention that, you know, we're already allowing certain um, uh, artwork on signs ourselves with CRA mm -hmm. on Atlantic Avenue couldn't get uh, probably any more apparent. Um, so I think that we are probably needing to have that discussion as to what we are allowing because we're doing it. So obviously it's hard to do something and then not allow others to do it. However, that said, this is very tasteful, as one of my colleagues just mentioned. It can get to the point where it's very distasteful. So we don't want to get there. Um, the, uh, one, every 100 feet having something, I think, is, is fair, as long as it's not you know, overwhelming. I think that I, I would be OK with it. I have no problem with what I'm seeing here. But if you increased the, the, the logo, more often like a repetitive type of thing, I think it will become a, a less, you know, it, it, it will be less um, tasteful. So I think that that's just something, if I could give you some comments when you're thinking about what you'd like to put before us, that, that would be mine. And by the way, I just want to also mention, you know, this is very nicely done, obviously upscale for the area that you're building in. The fence itself is is extremely nice, and you know, so it gives a real great look. Uh, a lot of times, you'll have this, you know, kind of a chain link fence that's falling down or not really looking. It's get they get, you know, tattered and torn by, I guess, you know, the construction um, equipment hitting it. This is just something that is very different. So this, I have absolutely no problem with. It just looks good. So that would be my comments, and I'm going to support. Anyone else? We'll take a motion then. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Anthea, may I add? And that was why I inquired about the spacing, because I would agree with the mayor that the distance is uh, 100 feet might be appropriate, but, but uh, I'd like to see distance. You wouldn't want to see everything oh, overlapping. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Okay, moving on to 7B, Resolution 113-21. Uh, yeah. That's right. Mayor Ex parte? Oh, None. I'm sorry. I, I, yes, you're right. We're still on the uh, quasi-judicial, so um, we, we have the swearing in. Um, so anybody who's had any ex parte communication, um, this item is the Atlantic Avenue. This is Sunday Village. Oh, Sunday Village, I'm sorry, Sunday Village. So um, let's start with the vice mayor. Did you have any conversation about signage for the Sunday Village with yeah, anybody? I, think I spoke with the applicant, Todd Benson, I want to say. Okay. Um, vice mayor? Yes, I have spoken with the owners, not specifically about signage, however. Okay. Well, this is, I think, signage, temporary sign construction signage, right? Correct. Yeah. So don't worry about it then. Uh, Commissioner Cassell? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, if I if anything, it would be on the uh, city server, and we'll ask. Um, I think he said nothing. Nothing. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, you're good to go. Um, city staff, can you enter the file into the project? Uh, the project file into the record. Can you pull mine up real quick? I'm sorry. I just want to check something. Sorry, the file number's on the first page. <laughs> so. Okay, so this. Um, yeah, I said. Okay, thanks. This is uh, Anthea Genetis, Development Services Director, for the record. This is okay. Um, a res uh, resolution for a waiver to this same um, issue that we just heard on the previous application. Um, in this case, it's file number 2021-203, which is specific to the waiver of um, the signage. There are other applications in process for Sunday Village, but this file is to this one. And the applicant, Mr. Cavelli, is here Great. on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. Okay. This is the clicker, I guess. All right. You can use the arrows if it's easier. I'm oh, sorry. Or you can use the arrows on the keyboard if it's easier. No, this is fine. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Cavelli, uh, 1209 South Swinton Avenue. Um, this is a request for waiver. Um, 
Very similar to one you just saw. Um, so why this waiver request? Um, this is a pro so proposed sign that's a series of images on the construction fence screening, just like you've just recently seen. And the current code doesn't really address these, these items. Per section 4.6.7 F3I for temporary signs, there are three um, items that you would look at. The first item is really the applicable one. Um, and in of the criteria, the signage is not a freestanding sign because it is on the fence, so we're okay there. It's not a seven foot high fence. It's only six feet because it's a constructed fence, so we're all right there. The sign face will not exceed 32 square feet and is on more than one street, not more than one free street frontage. In this particular case, it's larger than 32 square feet and it is on more than one street frontage, so therefore the, the waiver request. Um, the location of the, of the sign uh, is, um, one is on Atlantic Avenue, and it basically runs the, the front of Atlantic Avenue and wraps the corners. Um, and if you, it's a series of panels, and if you look closely at the, the drawing, you can kind of see where the panels are be below, and I'll show you in detail the panels in a minute. Um, and the frontage on Atlantic is about 230 feet long. And then down at the corner of South Swinton and uh, Southwest uh, First Street, there's another one that will just wrap the corner. We tried to make these panels uh, very tasteful. We're using muted colors. Um, there is not a lot of, uh, this is the developer, this is the, 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 you know, a lot of advertising. It's just a series of, of muted, very nicely done, not distracting um, panels that um, have some various images of the Sunday House, uh, uh, you know, some of the some of the historic structures being shown, um, and Cathcart House, and and that's basically what's going to be the essence of the sign. It's 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 um, not going to be a, a lot of directional and things like that. So with regards to um, the waiver, there are, uh, is section 2.47B5 that has some items that you have to uh, find, make positive findings for. The first one is the waiver shall not adversely affect the, the, the neighborhood. Well, the installation of the sign helps to buffer the, the um, um, construction site from the sidewalk and the street. Um, the images um, are, will provide visual interest for both pedestrians and uh, vehicular uh, passengers, but not being so uh, distracting that it causes any kind of, a, of an issue. So the granting of the waiver will not affect the, the neighborhood area in a negative way. The, the next item is that the waiver will not significantly diminish the provisions of public facilities. The, the fence is already up. It is uh, behind the sidewalk. The sidewalk is available for, for use. Um, these um, sign faces will be in place of a black um, fence that is currently there, which um, will really not affect public facilities in any way, so there should not be an issue with that section. The waiver will not create an unsafe situation. Again, it's the construction fence will separate construction from pedestrians. Um, the and, and and again, the the images are not distracting to um, drivers, so that that we don't create any kind of safety issues. Um, and and the sidewalk will remain open for uh, for the the pedestrians to use so there there won't be an unsafe condition where people have to cross the street to get through that section and the final one in in this section is the waiver does not result in granting of a special privilege um, you just approved one um, there there have been others approved um, here is is the one just west of this that is kind of difficult to read while you're driving in the car because there's so much information on it and it's a little distracting, but um, this, this is an example of, of another one that, that was approved. In addition to the section we, we just reviewed, section 4.4135B2 is also required to be evaluated because the north portion of this site is within the CBD overlay um, 
in block 61. So um, there are four other criteria. Uh, the, the first one is that the way will, re will not result in inferior pedestrian experience along a primary street, which Atlantic is a primary street such as exposing parking garage or large expansive blank walls. Well, there are no parking garages to be exposed and there are no blank walls. Um, but the, the addition of the, of the signs on the fence will add interest and, and help with the pedestrian experience. Um, the, the next item is, is that the waiver shall not allow the creation of significant incompatibilities with nearby buildings uh, or land use. Um, Again, it's a construction fence. It's, it's just being cleaned up and, and made more attractive through the addition of these images so there will not be uh, any compatibility created. And then the, the third item is that the waiver will not erode the connectivity of the street and sidewalk network or negatively impact any adopted bicycle or pedestrian master plans. The sidewalk will remain uh, in use, so it will not degrade that. So there, is, there should not be an issue with that. And finally, the waiver should not reduce the quality of civic open space provided under this code. Um, the, the, the civic space will be built as part of the project. So the, the approval of this will not affect civic open space. It will be built at the end of the project when, when the fence is removed. And so positive findings should be made for, for that section. So for these two sections, we, we, we've demonstrated that positive findings could be made and that this waiver could be approved. Um, if you have any questions, I'm available for comment. Thank you. Thank you. Sophia? <clears throat> okay, so. Okay, so this is the same um, sign provision that we just heard, which limits temporary identification signs. In this case, just for anybody um, watching at home, Sunday Village is a large project. This is um, a request related to Block 61, which is the main block of the project, although it does span you know, four other blocks. Um, it is in the Old School Square Historic Arts District. It has a central business overlay. And um, the request is to allow signage greater than 32 square feet. In this case, the signage that I think uh, you'll see is um, less commercial in that you know it's not arrows and open now um, or you know hours of operation. Um, it's very much I think meant to provide a more artful screening of the site while it's under construction. So, um, however, the graphics, because they exceed 32 square feet and 7 feet in height, um, they need, do need to be reviewed through this process. Um, they have provided sort of the overall panelization of what you would see down each street from the corner to Swinton and Atlantic, and the graphics do slightly shift. Um, work, Dine Shop, Sunday Village, um, and other things like that with the website for more information. Um, so in this case, uh, I think since it does span an entire block, um, it could have been for freestanding signs with posts on the sidewalk or close to the sidewalk. And so applying you know, the temporary signage to the construction signage and fencing does alleviate sort of that you know, potential litter in, in an area that's got a high amount of pedestrian activity usually. Um, and again, this, this project is within the boundaries of the Downtown Development Authority, and the DDA has expressed um, support of creating more visual interest on fencing of surrounding construction projects. Um, and right now, whether it's art or graphics, we don't have a mechanism. So on a case-by-case -case basis, they come for you for evaluation. I do appreciate that the applicant spoke to the CBD waiver requirements. Ultimately, we decided you don't need to make a finding on those because this is a provision that applies citywide and it's, it's not unique to the, the, um, the downtown. Um, but I'm here if you have any questions. Um, and I'll be this yes. Okay, very good. So at this point in time, what we're gonna do is open it up to public comment. So if anybody in the public that has been sworn in, and if you haven't, just let us know. 
um, would like to speak to it, please step forward. You'll have three minutes. Ready? Sorry. There. Hey, everybody. Uh, Laura Simon with the Downtown Development Authority. And um, as Anthea mentioned, and as I um, sent on behalf of our board, um, to allow for this um, temporary signage to, again, we have a lot of development in our downtown. We have construction projects that have been underway for m multi years and it is a temporary fence and this we have current projects right now that i would love for them to look like this um, it is a enhancement and as uh, we move forward and hopefully working with the city to bring forward a policy that would provide better um, direction and some uh, outline of what the expectation is going forward to the, the raise the quality and the caliber of uh, the signage throughout the downtown for future projects and for future uh, situations that temporary fence is needed. We just hope that you would um, support this request. It is a very uh, high traffic, very visual entryway, gateway into our community. It tells the story of a project that will need a story to be told as it goes through the development and um, as most do that are take multi-years uh, similar to George Bush it's a multi-year multi-year project extended months telling that story is very important so uh, we just ask for you to uh, approve this request thank you thank you very much Laura anyone else seeing no one public comment is closed back to the applicant and uh, staff any cross-examination seeing none and no rebuttal thank you very much to the Commission you know, this is a very, very different look from what we just looked at. So it's, it's, um, it's a little troubling from my perspective. I think it's really beautiful, but I, I, what, here's the problem that I'm having. Um, this is very nicely done, but the next one may not be. <laughs> and I'm concerned about that because it isn't every other, you know, every uh, 100 feet, it is, it is continuous. And I, I know it tells a story for that corner, I get that, but I mean, if we start going down this path, where is the, where do we, where do we draw the line? That's the concern that I have here. That would be, my, those would be my comments, because the other, it was like, it's plain, it's very, you know, just the symbols of the, but there's two different, two different reasons for that. We have a builder that's trying to pull people in to buy property and then we have somebody that's actually doing a development that they want to tell a story before it comes to entice people so it's there's two different things going on here but this concerns me because it's continuous and I'm concerned about that <clears throat> I'll leave it I'll let open the door to anyone else who wants to speak to it hey, yeah I would be far more open to approving examples like this rather than just all blue all green with one color logos you know all over it um, I think telling the story of what's coming to an area um, and done in a tasteful fashion, mm -hmm. graphics, no, you know, maybe no photography. I mean, we're going to have to set some, some mm -hmm. rules as we move forward, but I'd like to see more of this and less of the green fence we've all become accustomed to. Well, you know, it's interesting you bring that up because um, I was on a commission prior to that there wasn't even allowed to be anybody's logo on a... Uh, screening period I mean that's what I came from so to be going just even into the logos now and now um, all the way down it's it's very different for me and I'm not so sure that I mean I I'm it's I just worry that we might get a little too busy that's my only concern this is not to me but I think something else coming up maybe and then we're going to be kind of like we, we have to let the genie out of the bottle well we just put a process in place and put a proper board maybe they're approved by Sprad. maybe they're approved by the mm -hmm. art maybe they're approved by us I don't know yeah. but um but I know we're not talking about that tonight but the DDA yeah. did send an a, you know uh, a nice letter and recommendation this week yeah. I think it's something we should explore um uh, but I will absolutely be uh be in favor of this tonight Anyone else? No. Mayor? Yes, Vice Mayor? Yes, thank you very much. I think you've heard this before, and please don't think I'm trying to be comical, but location, location, location. This is a very large development in the heart of our city, and it's very. it could be distracting. I'm afraid I didn't get to see all of the graphics because the <laughs> my view isn't very good all the time and i missed seeing how it was going to look if there was a presentation but i'm also concerned about 
traffic, someone slowing down to view it. If you're walking, that's one thing. But if you're driving and we already have traffic jams at that intersection. So I'm, I would be more in favor of a plain screening with a, a, a name or something. We're, we're just artfully done perhaps, but overwhelming. It's, I don't know. Again, I didn't get to see it, so I'm I'm not going to be in favor of a continuous story that uh, is going to be something that uh, is going to be distracting and in the wrong location. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I believe Anthea said this goes to uh, another board for review. Is that correct? No, I think. Oh, it doesn't. We make no. determine that it didn't have to. Oh, I see. Because I'm somewhat in agreement in the sense that I. I definitely like this, and I think it's way better than any fence that's sitting there. But I am somewhat in agreement that I would have expected there might be some spacing in between. That would just be uh, one of those neutral colors. It does seem a little busy, but I, I'm going to I'm going to say yes to this because I would rather see this than the fence. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Um, Contain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Ms. Johnson? Mayor Petrolia? I'm, I'm sorry. No. And I, I will say yes and then with, with reservation, but mm -hmm. with this one, yes. Okay, thank you. okay, moving on to, thank you. Uh, resolution number 127-21. And, oh, I'm sorry. Any disclosure uh, or ex parte, uh, disclosure of ex parte communications from the commission. And this is the um, parking lot that's, uh, I want to say we're at T-Bones, uh, Dixie, and 10th. Mm -hmm. Correct? Okay, very good. Um, let's start with you, Vice Mayor. Any ex parte communication? Yes. Just say an email asking for approval. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cassell? Same with me, an email. Deputy Vice Mayor? None. I spoke with Mr. Weiner. Okay, and I have um, anything on my uh, server. Um, I believe I had probably communication with the um, owner eons ago. Um, and I'm not even sure if it was about this, but just in case. All right, so um, let's go ahead and put the... Uh, into the record. Yes, Anthea Genetis, Development Services Director. I'd like to enter file 2019-281 for the conditional use into the record. Um, there are a series of waivers related to landscaping that will be decided by SPRA mm -hmm. as part of the site plan review. Um, so you won't be making findings on those, but they are pertinent to the, um, to the considerations you make for the standards. And Mr. Weiner is here with an application. Sure. Good evening. Michael Weiner, 6111 Broken Sound Parkway, Boca Raton, Florida, for the applicant. Uh, there was a small crowd leaving here, and we weren't able to get in during the swearing in. So um, Mr. Balazares, who's here from Greco, and Greg sure. Molina and myself should be sworn in. There you go. No problem. I do. Good. I'll lower my mask. Sure. Uh, Mr. Balazares is an executive with Greco Motors, and Greg Molina is the architect on the project. Um, we're here to talk about the conditional use. Um, the applicant's name is Greco Motors LLC. Uh, the address is 15 Southeast 10th Street, Delray Beach, Florida. Uh, property is presently zoned CF. Um, pursuant to the land development regulations and also has a future land use designation of CF. Uh, the property was previously used by FPNL for storage of major equipment and uh, then is now being used or will be used as a private parking area by uh, Greco Motors. Um, over the years, it was determined that PZBs had seeped into the soils from the FPL, FPL use. Um, this required a substantial cleanup. Uh, Greco has undertaken this. It's now underway and we'll see it through to completion. Um, as I said, the use of the parking, uh, the use is, is for a private parking use. Let me see if I've got this going the right way. Oh my, I did it. 
Um, and so we're here for a conditional use. Uh, the reason the matter looks familiar to you is that um, in 2019, 2020, you did a similarity of use. You, you, you got a quirky code. I think we know that. And so under CF, we actually had to have a determination that what we were going to do there was similar to what was mentioned in CF. So a lot of this may be similar to you or familiar to you. I will go through it as quickly as I can. Um, so on that similarity of use, it was uh, uh, brought to the PNC board. They passed it. Then to you in February of 2020, you passed it. Um, so that, as I say, these issues might be familiar with you. Then to go back with, to the conditional use, after you pass through uh, similar use, we went back to PNC on June 21st, 2021. They also gave us a unanimous recommendation to you tonight. So the reference is to a special service. That's where we are in the CF code. Um, it's called a special service. Um, as you'll notice, it, it called out garages, actually refuse, <coughs> refuse transfer stations, bus stations and taxi dispatches. As I said, we've already put to bed the issue of whether a private parking lot can be there, and, and it can be. Um, to make this quick, so we've said this to the Planning and Zoning Board. We say it again tonight. Um, my client agrees to security lighting, proper maintenance, trash removal, no unloading by tractor trailers, locking and closing gates during non-business hours, prohibition of sales, no location of vehicles by key fobs. These are items three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine in the staff memorandum. So there's just two that we'll talk about a little bit. Um, there was uh, a, a little bit of a twist that happened today. Um, Anthea referred to it, um, and, and that makes it, uh, a, a little longer explanation with respect to items one and two, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, uh, while all the things that I just mentioned are site plan issues, we, we, we really don't want to quibble with you, um, um, and, and your SPRAB board will, of course, um, make them part of the um, uh, site plan itself. But you know Greco has been a good team player. They want to be a, a good neighbor. So as to all those technical points, on the record, there is agreement. Um, so now let's con go to the conditional use itself. So let me see here for a moment. So um, in order to do that, um, we have the purpose and intent. It's a private purpose. That was settled, as I said, by the, by the uh, uh, similarity of use. So we meet the purpose and intent. And this brings us to the section 2.4.5e, which are the factors to consider for conditional use. Uh, the use should not have a significantly detrimental effect on the stability of the neighborhood and should not hinder development of nearby properties. I'll demonstrate this when we review the plans itself. We'll get there in just a moment. Um, you know, it, it's funny because unfortunately, you don't vote on the site plan. It's all spread out. Um, it makes this presentation a little disjointed. I'm, I'm sorry for that, but, but you'll, you'll hear a little bit more about that. But the important point is that we meet the findings of 2.4.5e, but to do that, you will be examining some site plan issues. Um, but rest assured, sufficient information has been submitted to Planning and Zoning Department, so they have determined, and you'll hear in Anthea's report that we have a positive staff report, that we do meet all the criteria. So, Past 2.4.5e, there's also chapter three. Those are the additional provisions we have to meet. They come in four parts. The first is easily demonstrated. As I said, we're zone CF. Our future land use is CF. The second concerns concurrency. The staff report states, you'll see up on the screen, we meet all of them. There has to be a renewed letter. This has taken so long that the traffic performance letter has expired, but we will get the renewed letter. We're not worried about it. The, the, the traffic generation for a private parking lot is, is, is almost nil. Um, the third part of, of chapter three has to do consistency with the comprehensive plan. We have no concerns about that. You'll also hear from that in the staff report. And the fourth requirement is final review by SPRAB and the city commission to make sure that all LDR regulations are met. And that's where it gets bifurcated because we have to go to site plan to, to sew up those last things. So, so now let me, let me show you the site. So that, that's the site. 
Um, as you said, it, I, I think the mayor used T-bone. We don't, we don't like to quite use that phrase in the automotive <laughs> industry, but um, it, 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 it is there. Um, the, probably the most important thing about this is that the, and I, I think you can see it, ex the, the uh, land um, marked as parcel A, that, that triangle, that will all be landscaped and, and all remain green um, and pervious. Um, and we're quite excited about that. It means that w it's a little more intense use, which what has to do with those waivers, but it's really the best approach to the site. That's going to be great um, in, in terms of the community because there's houses to the, to the east of that. Um, that's what we wanted to preserve. Um, there, you'll notice how many buildings there are on the property right now, but, and these are the existing site conditions that, that are there now. This is the way FPNL used it. But only one of the buildings remain, and that's this one building here. This is its present state. Mm -hmm. um, and Greg will talk more about this, but this is what will be done. Of course, there'll be foundation plantings. The architectural elevations will be changed substantially. Um, uh, it will be brought up to code. Uh, I think you'll find it to be very pleasant. Here's what the proposed design looks like as, as an aerial. Um, you'll notice how much setback we have from, from the, the houses to the uh, east. You'll also notice that we've cut, uh, that we've actually blocked the cutoff to the uh, residential area. There's now only one means of ingress and egress. We can do that because, again, a private property uh, um, parking lot, the traffic generation is so low, we only need one entrance. And so we've improved it so that the area around it, the residential area around it, will have no commercial interference. You can see the, the landscaping buffers, all of which are met. Um, by the way, the, the waivers don't have to do with the width of the buffers. They, they have to do with other things. So you can rest assured that um, once we bring these plans through SPRAB, that we will meet all the requirements that the project meets uh, the code and the standards. So let me return to those two site plan uh, issues that are suggested in the staff report. Um, we'd actually be discussing both the internal waivers to the parking and those two items tonight, but there was discovered um, just this afternoon in a thorough reading of the code the 2.23D entitled Duties, Powers, and Responsibilities actually makes a specific delegation to the site plan. That's why you lifted it and took it off your agenda. And, and you know, I have to go first. It, it, it's the city's code. I think Anthea might say more to you about it. Um, but uh, I have to confront the issue. So, so that pr particular provision says the board hereby, that is the site plan review board, has the authority to take action on the following items pursuant to the procedures and standards of the LDR. And the next one says granting of relief under section 4.6.16 through the waiver process. Those are those internal waivers for, for, for uh, landscaping. It also goes on to say, and I, again, I'm quoting it, streetscape and landscaping features, and then in parentheses, e.g., we all know what that stands for. For example, walls, fences, lighting, dumpsters, and enclosures. So the first two things that you were talking about in the staff report, that was a recommendation on whether or not there should be fences or walls. We didn't take it off the agenda necessarily. And, and, and while maybe it should be in that same category, um, I, you know, when I sit down, I, I have to be a good man and sit down fully. And I don't know if you're gonna, going to look at them all together. Okay. So all that I want to say on fences is that we find fences to be friendlier, we find walls to be more industrial, and we find that walls will only give an opportunity, fences will not. But what we really like to say is that knowing that certain things have to go to SPRAB, and we show up at SPRAB and they say, what, this is already decided for me, I thought we were bored with our own independent thoughts, that you leave those aside and let's grab make the review of the walls and fences. We already took off the agenda tonight. 
those things that have to do with the uh, internal uh, landscaping. We're here to answer any questions. I am sure that Greg can do a much better job on this, the uh, site plan. He's designed it. If you should have any additional questions concerning it, again, it may be familiar to you having seen it before. Thank, Thank you for you. the time. Thank you. Anthea? Okay. So, Anthea Geniotis, Development Services Director. Um, so, the, so I think there's been a pretty good background reminder of, of how this particular use has, has come to be brought forward as a conditional use on the site. Um, there was a similarity of use that was brought forward um, by uh, this applicant, um, setting forward that the community facilities um, zoning district which allowed a privately operated parking lot um, it was ultimately determined that a privately operated parking lot for the purposes of storing vehicles or overflow storage um, was similar enough that um, the application could proceed um, under the same conditional use category that the privately operated parking lot could so you'll remember that site from this what's before you now is a conditional use um, to allow that privately owned parking lot that will serve as overflow storage for Graco Motors. Um, ultimately, there's 252 total vehicle storage spaces. There's nine employee spaces. Uh, they are arranged both tandem and standard spaces, and there's for a total of 262. There are various improvements to the existing parking lot, new striping, landscaping, and some buffering as well. Um, Two of the existing warehouse buildings are going to be demolished and one it will remain and be um, renovated, which will be part of the review that SPRAB will do review after this. As part of your findings with Chapter 3, and this is where we've had a bit of overlap between the waivers and the buffering of the use and what part goes with the use and what part goes with the site plan, um, because ultimately you have to review this for future land use, consistency, the concurrency impacts, um, consistency and compatibility with the surrounding areas and then compliance with the LDRs and that's part of why the waivers have been brought forward for your consideration. So in terms of concurrency, there's a full analysis in the Planning and Zoning Board staff report. Um, we're always interested in traffic and how these changes affect our traffic. So um, just to let you know that um, they, are, they have received um, a traffic performance standard approval from the county. This um, change in use is expected to bring eight new morning peak hour trips and 15 afternoon trips. So it's not a big traffic generator that we're going to see in terms of traditional traffic. Um, I do think that we have to um, recognize that our temporary lots for vehicle storage for Graco and for other car lots have required a series of conditions such as not unloading new cars from the trailers and the public rights of way. I've personally witnessed this on some of the temporary ones. So while the traffic for the employees coming to and from the site um, is not expected to be an issue. The resolution does contain the condition about not using the public rights of way. This is not a temporary lot that goes away in a year or two. This is a permanent use. So we need to be sure we're going to be good neighbors. Um, the drainage, the applicant has provided 27% open space, which does exceed the minimum. A full drainage review will be part of the site plan and is in the process of review and moving forward now. There are several um, comprehensive plan policies or more in the backup from the Planning and Zoning Board report, but I would call out to you that we do have um, a policy in the Neighborhoods District and Corridors element um, basically talking about um, really trying to improve our FEC and CSX train corridor routes. Brightline does travel through our city, and, and that's part of you you get as a passenger going through um, Delray Beach and ultimately hopefully the coastal link will provide commuter rail service as well which is part of why there's a lot of focus on what is that kind of long elevation of this site look like um, it also borders a city park a little that's there and there's some opportunity there that we'd like to see someone take advantage of and that's part of what's brought up to you in the staff report and again the housing element you know we're really concerned about just making sure that this use would be a good neighbor to the surrounders which in the past, we've had issues of the dealers locating the vehicles, using the key fobs, and setting off the alarms, which doesn't make for a great 
experience if you live close by and since this is going to be in Osceola Park that is another condition that is attached to the resolution before you um, because this isn't temporary policing that turns into a code enforcement issue we don't revoke conditional uses the way that you have the power to do with temporary lots so again compliance with the LDR is the SPRAP will review three landscape waivers um, as part of their site plan approval and this board uh, can watch that and then I think knowing the use that is also being uh, accommodated um, there's always a, an appeal process if you don't think the resolution has been resolved through the applicant and the board appropriately um, they are they are related to internal landscaping it's not related to the buffer it's not related to anything external um, however I do think it's important to note that the site plan that the Planning and Zoning Board removed when they made, reviewed when they looked at this conditional use had a masonry wall on the north and the south with chain link fencing along the FEC in the east and so what's come back in is all chain link fencing and so that's a little bit of a difference from what your board saw again it will go to SPRAB but um, you know while there is little to no landscaping on the outside of the fence certainly nothing that is goes beyond the minimum standard a lot of the lush landscaping you see on the images is internal to the site and I think that's an important distinction um, while chain link fence these are four and five are comments that were made as part of the septed review and TAC um, while it is a cost-effective option for restricting access it does also wear quickly over time um, and the septed review does recommend that to secure the property with you know very lovely vehicles being stored at all hours that um, and recognizing there's very little lighting along the FEC track that a masonry wall might be a better option for the applicant as well as providing um, a little more shielding for the neighborhood around it so again the waivers that this will are, are under the purview of SPRAB and not this board and, unless appealed they are related to to the internal landscaping that you see here um, this is the site plan um, that it has come up and that green stripe to this side is the uh, FEC line and that's the border of the fence so a lot of the landscaping and um, trees that you see planted really are internal to the site which is part of why this has been raised as how much can we put on the outside of the site the green space that um, you see here ah, I'm going too fast this is part of a city on buffer along the street this is not part of the site or something that the applicant is providing so you know just to put it in context it's, it's very lush and lovely but you know there might be some adjustments that SPRAP could oversee to make sure that we have as much green as possible on the outside of the fence uh, for the neighborhood and the FEC corridor and other things like that that's all that we've brought up with with the conditional use itself and that is part of the findings that you are required to make which is making sure that the neighborhood is has a very stable neighbor um, and that it doesn't hinder the development uh, or redevelopment of nearby properties okay now this is a lot on a slide and you guys know I don't try to drown you in text this is a list of the nine conditions that are attached to the resolution in front of you today um, when the Planning and Zoning Board recommended approval five to zero they did recommend it with conditions however uh, the ones in white they did not include in their motion because they felt that that was something that the SPRAB should deal with that it was really not under their purview so they did not feel the need uh, to bring forward that the masonry wall with landscaping had to be the solution um, or that um, you know that there had to be a mural or something on the FEC right-of-way they moved their approval with what you see in yellow which is more related to the pure function of this of the property as um, a car storage lot um, basically requiring security lighting which probably review as part of the photometrics um, maintaining some of the, the these are the conditions you typically see with the temporary lots that the property has to be clean and orderly uh, debris and trash removed regularly um, that parking loading and unloading of the vehicles will not occur outside of the property that means not on 10th inside the property <laughs> um, I'm not trying to be flip but this is an issue we have with these uses chronically um, 
and then um, that the gate, there is a gate that was has been shown. There's not enough queuing to have the gate closed during work hours, so it's the kind of gate that will be closed when the property has been secured for the evening, um, and so that's important to do, but it, they, it can't remain closed during work hours because we were worried about the impacts of traffic coming out. Um, sales activity is not to occur on this property. It has to occur at the dealership. No customers are coming on. Um, and then uh, most importantly, especially for the surrounding neighborhood, you cannot find the inventory by clicking the key fobs and setting off the alarms. I've personally witnessed this multiple times with different dealers, including Graco. So please be a good neighbor. These people live there and we wanna be sure we're not bothering them. Um, I would also just like to say in terms of the fencing, the fencing that the applicant showed was a privacy fence, which was wood with hedges. What is in the application currently is chain link. So just to be clear on, on, on what the graphic application truly is. And that concludes my presentation. I'm pretty sure, yes. So I'm here for any questions that you may have. Great. Well, let's open it up to public comment. If there's anybody here who would like to speak to resolution number 127-21, please step forward, state your name. You have three minutes. James Quillian, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. Um, about two years ago, the neighborhood met with the applicant, um, went over their plans, approved of their plans, liked everything that they saw. They seemed to bend over backwards asking what we wanted. We told them. They gave it to us. Then uh, planning and zoning and the city seemed to come in after the fact and start adding stuff that as a neighborhood we wouldn't want. We wouldn't want a brick wall all the way around the property. We want it to be beautified with plants and vegetation. We don't want that to be blocked with a brick wall. Someone from the city said something to the effect, well, they were thinking about maybe they could put a mural on it for people driving by on a train to enjoy. You know, like, we love art in the neighborhood, but usually when we have a mural, it's to cover up an ugly wall or an ugly fence. You don't create an ugly wall or an ugly fence in order to put a mural on it. It doesn't make sense. Why would you have beautiful vegetation in order to put a privacy fence around it to block it? It doesn't make sense. So why would you be asking an applicant that's bent over backwards working with the community to give us what we want to do something that we don't want? It doesn't make sense. Why? Why? Unless there's, it's deliberate in order to prevent them from doing what they said they were going to do, which is what we want them to do. Previously um, at commission and PNZ a year ago or more, they had suggested, well, maybe we could use this as a sewage treatment plant area. Neighborhood doesn't want that. We would like to have that parking lot there. Well, we could have a garbage transfer station there. The neighborhood doesn't want that. We want them to be able to park cars there because they're going to make it so much better than it already is right now. Bob wire fence surrounding the property, you know, previously when FPL and other uh, entities used it, it was never taken care of. They want to finish the project and then take care of the property. Please let them. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, anyone else? Seeing no one, have a comment. <coughs> Back to the um, applicant and uh, staff, is there any rebuttal testimony or cross, I'm sorry, cross examination or rebuttal testimony? Any cross? <laughs> Michael Weiner, Michael Weiner for the record again. Um, I, I, I just want to make the record straight. There was a confusing array of, of numbers, and um, I think I mentioned eight. Um, eight was not part of the staff, uh, the site plan, uh, the um, planning and zoning board's approval. Um, we would go to the site plan review board with respect to signage, uh, as we would with any other project, um, and I'm sure that they will address it tastefully. Um, as well, so I just wanted to correct the uh, record there. Uh, Ron has told me there will be no barbed wire, and Ron has also told me whatever additional landscaping should be on the outside as determined by SPRAB, we obviously will do. The preference is for there to be landscaping. The, the walls just seem to be extremely dangerous and, and really not um, uh, called for, uh, and, and uh, the community does seem in support of seeing green. And, and, and not white walls. So um, actually, I'm, I'm hoping you just leave it to Sprab, um, 
and, and then I suggest to you that maybe you look at your, your, your own ordinances mm -hmm. because maybe you want to group these things together. Um, that would make it easier for us even. Um, but we don't mean to dodge any questions. Um, we just know we have to face SPRAB and they'll have their own opinions. So thank you. Okay, great. Anything else, uh, Anthea, rebuttal or cross? No, no? I, I think the only reason that um, the staff looked at the mural idea as well as it is part of Osceola Park's redevelopment plan. They're a very arts-based community, so we certainly didn't mean to any disrespect to the neighborhood. It was consistent with the adopted plan, so it seemed like a good opportunity. That's all. Thank you. Okay, great. So to the commission. I have a question just real quick. Um, I know that it said that it was deliberate to... I mean, Mr. Quillian had made it that, you know, what are we doing trying to make something more deliberate? Is, is it the reason that you put the wall, the, the solid wall up, because that's part of what our LDRs call for? Is that the reason why? It's not right. anything that we're, like, trying to make a hurdle so that someone can't get over it, correct? Right. I mean, in this case, it's next to a right-of-way. We do require a masonry wall with any commercial business that's adjacent to a residential area. So I think there was some consistency right. and other opportunities. We're certainly not trying to purposely undermine the neighborhood. But, so. you know, there's a nice buffer there, and um, I think green is probably better than a right. wall anyway. And, like, there, there was a lot of things put up there about, you know, kind of graffiti, mm -hmm. that sort of thing happening afterwards. And I'm not so sure that, I mean, SEPTED maybe... I don't know. It could go either way with that. But I'm, I am concerned, and I know that this is probably something a Sprout is going to deal with about that foliage. I don't want to see a chain link fence on the outside and exactly. have the beautification on the inside. So that's really important. Um, and I know that's not our purview, but that will be theirs, correct? Are we doing right. just the, the things at this? So I think ultimately when I'm, in, I'm looking at, at Ms. Schellen mm -hmm. now, too, <laughs> um, if you decide to make a motion that I think the easiest thing would do to tell us which of the numbered conditions you want to include or exclude, and if you want to follow planning board's lead, then just say excluding one, two, and eight or something. Um, and then ultimately you do have another opportunity because if you don't, you know, when Sprav's right, decision can, is final, appeal. it does it does come on to the appealable right. report. And so now the drop off of vehicles, because that has been an issue, um, you know, here's the problem. A lot of times it's uh, it has to do with the timing. Uh, you know, code is not out there just driving around waiting, and then, you know, we have this, we get the call in, and by the time somebody responds, the tractor trailer's gone. So how will we manage that in the event that that's not followed? So ultimately, uh, if it's chronic, then yes. we would um, take code enforcement action. Okay. And then one other question, the land to the north, was there any problems with the um, content of uh, whatever it was that was in the ground and has that been um, uh, eradicated? There, you know, the, the land to the north that you're gonna have it just for the, almost like it's it's a buffer land. Um, I'm sure I can imagine kids will probably go over there because it's not gonna be fenced in, is it? No. no. That will be an open area. Correct. So Correct. is there anything in that ground that is um, concerning as far as um, any chemicals? You know, you, you'd mentioned that there was some things left behind from FPNL. I'm just wondering, it, it, did that parcel of land show any problems? The, first of all, I, I don't know exactly where the wall, wells are planted, mm -hmm. but the wells will be there, and it is being remediated okay. um, pursuant to RECLA and, and uh, CERCLA. Um, so that's meeting the federal standards. Okay. Well, as long as yeah. we are, I just don't want to end up with a situation where we've made it look almost inviting and then have issues. That's all. Got it. Uh, uh, Ron was mentioned to me he, he, he wanted to come up to the microphone and swear that that will not happen. He feels strongly about that. But, What's that? Uh, that, that they are not going to bring trucks over there. It's not equipped to bring okay. the 18-wheelers the, okay, the over there. So. Very good. Um, Commissioner Boylston? Thank you. So I'm looking at the shall not adversely affect the neighboring areas, shall not significantly diminish the provision of public facilities. I've had a, a lot of conversations with some of the neighbors over there, and although they have shared that they don't want a big wall, they also don't want a chain link fence. Um, so I don't know if there's an opportunity to do something similar to like what Brightline did. I know we think put the chain link fence up and put landscaping, but then the landscaping's not taken care of, it doesn't grow in, and then all we do is have this big chain link. I would like to never see a chain link fence in Delray again. Um, but uh, um, this is permanent. This isn't like any of the temporaries that we've done. This is right. permanent. So I don't know if there is a fair uh, middle ground 
like a you know a black aluminum style fence with landscaping yes. um, that would make me feel more confident that this is not adversely affecting the neighboring area and this does come directly from some of those neighbors especially on the north end Okay. And I would be in support of that too because you know what, even if the landscaping it does start to look shabby, you still have a beautiful fence That's there. So I'm, saying, yeah. I'm with that. Anyone else? For Vice the Mayor? record, Ron is, me, is nodding, me. saying that is, that's absolutely possible. Thank you. Vice Mayor? Thank you. I'm, I'm very in favor of listening to the neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, neighborhood representation. I only heard one. Uh, I didn't. I don't know who Commissioner Boylston spoke with. They obviously could not make it to tonight's meeting. I'm not in favor of a solid wall. I can see it for some other type of operation in another location. I like the idea of the wrought iron fence or aluminum fence. And I am also concerned, Mayor, about the north end of the property. Mm -hmm. If there is nothing, then I... Did I misunderstand that there's just going to be landscaping, that, that anyone could come and go onto the property? It, there's not going to be any uh, fencing around that. That's just going to also, that's going to be just almost like a, a green area. Hmm. I would be very concerned about that. Not just, we were talking about security. How can you fence in three sides of a property no no it's it, it would be almost like four sides and then there's a piece that's almost like a, a very thin triangular piece that goes north that's part of this parcel uh, that they won't be utilizing so it'll be fenced off before that road if you will that kind of divides uh, the the north side mm -hmm. from the uh, residential community okay I wasn't very clear on the graphics right. that or glitchy and come up for about five seconds after you've done it 10 minutes ago. So anyway, I didn't get a chance to really look at it. But um, I would be in favor of whatever the neighbors would like to have. Our ordinances don't always fit 100%. Our LDRs don't always do 100%. So whatever SPRAV comes back with, it sounds like they're going to be the ultimate deciders of this. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Vice Mayor? Anything? But, uh, Commissioner Cassell? No, I'll do a motion to approve uh, with the conditional uses uh, recommended on June 21st by the Planning and Zoning Board, including three, four, five, six, seven, nine, and excluding one, two, and eight, and that we recommend that Sprab look at this carefully for the landscaping. Second. Second. I'm sorry, just for discussion, yes. can, can we include the element that I brought up in regards to the fencing. fencing. Oh, yeah, I thought that, that was, uh, my apologies, and including uh, Commissioner Boylston's recommendation regarding the fence. Second again. Thank you. Okay. Second. <laughs> Call the roll, please. <laughs> Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Ms. DeFranco? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good luck. Um, we 7D is off, right. uh, taken off the agenda, so we are at 7E, which is the ratification of emergency regulations. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Ms. Jellin, let me ask you a question. Are we still under an emergency uh, order? I thought that was removed, or for some reason I was thinking that our own? Okay, so it's our own. Correct. This is the Delray Beach one that we've had consistently. Gotcha. Palm Beach County reinstated something today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. very good. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so moving on to 7F, which is the Delray Beach Art League, use of the City Hall as the exhibition space. And we have Duncan here. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Deputy <laughs> Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. The city has been approached by the Delray Art League, a nonprofit uh, 5013C that has over 50 years of community involvement to resume the art displays in the city lobby. So we thought this would be a great opportunity for you, the public to be aware that this is something that is usually or traditionally takes place here and to get any feedback from the commission, excuse me, moving forward. So we're looking for consensus from the commission to resume that activity. Very good, open to the board. You know, if I can, may, I I, sure. I love the display, but I, I think, it, I, I've said this before, it kind of looks a little, you know, 
tired, but I, I think maybe, I mean, it's, it's difficult to change that, you know. Um, so I don't know if there's anything that we can do to kind of make it look a little bit more, um, mm -hmm. you know, lift it. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly um, I'm, I'm in agreement with uh, displaying artwork um, in City Hall for sure. Anyone else? Mayor? Yes, ma'am. Mayor? Yes. Uh, you. This item has brought to mind that um, our lobby is really, really a mishmash and horrible. I love the artwork, but because of the state of our lobby, it takes away from it. I don't know if maybe we can limit the size of it, because once the art is there, it just becomes even more crowded and I don't know. It's just you don't even you can't even appreciate the art because of the the way it, they don't have enough room to display and maybe they display too much. I'm I'm not in that business or industry, so I don't know what their objectives are. But uh, our our lobby really is is not attractive. I'll leave it at that. That's my only comment. Very good. So if we can make it as attractive as possible. I yes. Understood. <laughs> All right. Very good. So um, with that, is this a discussion item or is this we need a, a vote? I don't think you need a vote. Okay. Very Motion good. to approve. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Call the roll <laughs> or have a vote. Okay. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. All right, moving on. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Duncan. Um, uh, nomination for appointment for the Board of Adjustment. We're going to start with uh, um, commission, I mean, uh, Deputy Vice Mayor uh, Frankel. Move the name Alexandria Hayes. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the, um, call the roll. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. And so the first four members, by the way, are going to be the, um, the permanent, and then we'll have two alternates. Okay, the second person is Commissioner Cassell. Uh, yes, I will reappoint Garland Williams. Second. Any discussion? Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Moving on to um, Commissioner Bolston. The nomination? I do. I know I'm not going to say this right, but Mr. I would like to reappoint Mr. Vlad. <laughs> Vlad, that's all you Vlad. have to do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Second. We know who you're talking about. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. And Ms. Johnson? Vice yes, Mayor? I'd like to move um, the name of um, Mr. Roger Cohen. Second. Okay, any discussion? guys are killing me. Uh, seeing none, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. I'm going to um, move the name Fredericks. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? And we have one more for an alternative, um, and this would be with uh, um, Deputy Vice Mayor Frankel. Move the name Scott Frank uh, Scott Clark. There you go. Second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Okay, great. And we are moving on to nominations for the appointment of Historic Preservation Board. I think uh, we just have one for um, with uh, Julie Cassell. Right, that's my carryover. And thank you yes. for that accommodation for uh, Ms. Elise Lundstrom. Second. Reappointed. Okay, very good. Any discussion? Let's call the roll. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Okay, great. And then we go to the site plan and review board, and we have one for um, a nomination from uh, Commissioner Boylston. Yes, I would. Oh, sorry. Okay, so you got to Clark. You have to take off some of these because they just were picked, I think. Correct. Clark Cohen. Yeah, Cohen and Demiscu. 
Those are not available now. Right. Right. Um, Hayes, Hayes is off. I think that's the correction. Cohen is available because there was a Roger Cohen and then there's a Stephen oh, Cohen. Stephen yes, Cohen is I was on looking at R. So S. Cohen is available. Okay. Excuse yes. me. Sure, because that's who I was yep. going to move forward. I'd like to move the name Stephen Cohen. There you go. Second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. And yes. Okay, we are now at um, our public hearings. And this is a first reading for ordinance 17 uh, 21. And this will be, have public comment if, if anybody would like to. Long so. one. Take a drink. You're ready. Here we go. <laughs> An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances, Chapter 4. Zoning regulations, Article 4.3, District regulations, General provisions, Section 4.3.3, Special requirements for specific uses, Subsection W, Veterinary clinics, to rename the subsection as uses involving domestic animals, and to provide specific regulations regarding outdoor use areas, overnight boarding, disposal of carcasses, site and structural requirements, hours of operation, and separation requirements. Amending Article 4.4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.9, General Commercial GC District. Subsection B, principal uses and structures permitted, and subsection D, conditional uses and structures permitted. Section 4.4.11, neighborhood commercial NC district. Subsection B, principal uses and structures permitted, and subsection D, conditional uses and structures permitted. Section 4.4.12, land commercial PC district, subsection B, principal uses and structures permitted. Section 4.4.13, central business CBD district. Table 4.4.13a, allowable uses in the CBD subdistricts. Section 4.4.16, professional office POD district. Subsection D, conditional uses and structures allowed. Section 4.4.18, land commercial center, PCC district. Subsection B, allowed uses. Section 4.4.19, mixed use and commercial, M MIC district. Subsection B, principal uses and structures permitted. And subsection D, conditional uses and structures permitted. Subsection 4.4.20, industrial I district. Subsection B, principal uses and structures permitted. And subsection D, conditional uses and structures permitted. Section 4.4.24, old school square historic arts district, OSHAD. Subsection B, principal uses and structures, subsection D, conditional uses and structures allowed, and subsection H, special district regulations, section 4.4.26, light industrial LI district, subsection B, principal uses and structures permitted, and subsection 4.4.26D, conditional uses and structures allowed, section 4.4.29, mixed residential, office and commercial, MROC district, subsection B, principal uses and structures permitted, and subsection D, conditional uses and structures allowed, to identify the zoning districts where uses involving domestic animals are allowed as a principal use by right or conditional use. Amending Appendix A, definitions to include definitions for animal shelter, domestic animals, domestic animal services, pet hotel and pet services, providing a conflicts clause and a severability clause authority to codify and providing an effective date. Because this does change uses, it is a public hearing today. Um, on the dais today, um, staff left you a collection of emails. Um, they were also emailed to you before today. I just want to clarify that um, this ordinance is not going to grant any any approvals to any um, doggy daycare, um, any anything that is currently in place. What this ordinance does, it provides a pathway for any, um, any businesses that are currently functioning outside of their approvals to be able to come before the commission and, and seek approvals. So I would just caution the public um, those comments tonight really need to be tailored specifically to the ordinance and not to a specific um, organization because, again, that is premature. This ordinance still has another reading to go. After that, an, an application would be submitted to the city. The commission would consider a conditional use, waivers, whatever is appropriate. And at that time, you know, based on that applicant, the comments uh, may or may not be appropriate. So I just wanted to put that out there. Very good. Well, we're not going to have a presentation tonight because it's a first read, but we will invite the public up to make any comments that they would like to make, keeping it general to um, the actual ordinance that we're talking about, not specific to any um, organization that is uh, currently looking to um, uh, change the their, I mean, be able to have that uh, potential use. So if anybody would like to speak to this ordinance, please step forward and, oh, nope. State your name and address. You have three minutes. I'm 
I'm not sure what time it is, so I, I'll say good day. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Gail Lee McDermott. I live at 721 Southeast 3rd Avenue in Delray Beach, and I speak on my own behalf. <clears throat> Residents of Delray Beach and other towns daily use these domestic animal services. I'm one of them. People spending money in these businesses bring revenue to Delray Beach, but you know that. Many domestic animal services, service businesses, that's hard to say, <laughs> dot Federal Highway, north and south. That means they may back onto residential neighborhoods with one-story houses. Osceola Park, my neighborhood, is one of them. Domestic animal services open up in existing one-story structures. These businesses do not need or want two stories to chase faster four-legged clients upstairs or down. They do not need multi-story, wide-open, state-of-the-art spaces. These owners make amazing things happen to older buildings. Consider the residential communities. I have heard of a fear that domestic animal services somehow lowers property values. How? The use of existing one-story business structures backing onto their own backyards pretty much as they've been for many years. Or new, bright, shiny, multi-story buildings shadowing their neighbors' backyards and roofs. Domestic animal services are low profile, literally, and good for the neighborhood. Kindly consider the residential communities and kindly vote in favor of ordinance number 1721. Thank you very much. Good job, Gail. You kept it on the, the right on the target. Anyone else? <laughs> Hi there. Hi, Lisa Quillian, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. Um, I want to be very clear that the, the what's in front of you is being read. This is asking for all of those areas to have this allowance without a conditional use unless they have this outside area. So currently, what's being proposed is that suddenly lots of residential bordering areas can have a boarding facility overnight. They'd be allowed to do it as long as they don't have an outside area without a conditional use. So it really is the issue right now that we are hearing these indoor overnight kennels, that's the overnight boarding that is the issue. So the outside area, I don't know why that I was even separated in this proposal, doesn't really make a difference for the neighbors. I can tell you personally, it's not easy to hear neighbors complain, right? We don't wanna to have to come in here every time there's a problem. It has not been easy in these last months. Um, but when I drove by last night, and I was on Federal Highway, and I didn't even pull into a driveway to a currently running uh, overnight kennel. And I heard the dogs barking. I said, well, what happens every time this loud car comes by? There goes the barking again. I can't imagine, first of all, sitting in my backyard listening to that. Um, so I don't understand why any overnight kennel would be allowed right up to a residential area. There are plenty of areas on that map that don't have that. So I don't know why Federal Highway was included in this, because obviously it goes right up against those residential houses. So I, I think this map somehow included that area when really we know that it's not an appropriate thing to do next to a residential area. We know that a budding and overnight kennel that has a high likelihood of having that loud noise, of course, the building matters, right? The, the loudness of the building, but the only thing in your writing there that even helps code stop that is that they will insulate to minimize the noise. We have an engineer that lives along that area. He said, what do you mean? There's no decibels, there's no objective measure to actually get code on these if they open up and cause a problem. Another neighbor that alongs that, she said, any place that's having this overnight barking issue, there needs to be more looked into. So it's just not appropriate to be that close. And all of these things, unfortunately, in this proposal, don't really help the fact that it's still abutting that area. So this needs to be changed, whether we put a conditional use on everything, not just the outside thing. So if we put a conditional use on all boarding overnight, 
that would make sense. I'm not sure that code enforcement can still enforce that and we would probably still have approvals of conditional use um, and then suddenly have problems as residents forever. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Sir. James Quillen, 925 Southeast 2nd Avenue. Um, we tried to work with um, planning and zoning department. We tried to work with the planning and zoning board. Um, I had uh, said to them previously in, in the meeting that they approved to send this to you, that they, they were approving, possibly going to approve something, send it to you before it was fully formed. Now, the way I think city government should work is that these things should be worked out. Um, rational uh, minds should work on it, come to rules and the way it should be, tweak it, mold it, bake the cake, send it to you fully formed. It shouldn't have to come to you to get tweaked. It should be a beautiful looking cake already. You can prove it. It's a streamlined city government, but it doesn't seem the way that it always works. It it's always seems to be that, I, that we have to get the neighbors out to help you figure out the best way to, to do this after the fact, when this all could have been done months ago. A conditional use for any, um, any services along that area would take care of this. A lot of people, they love dogs and pets in the area. They're not saying they don't want any type of uh, pet services anywhere along uh, the residential area. They're just saying there are certain areas where it's better than others and other areas where it's definitely questionable. In this particular spot, like I said, you're not deciding that tonight. But, but since this particular issue of, of one spot caused some issues, it's ca called into question how the neighbors along um, Federal Highway, you know, the residential that backs that way, they're very wary of the, the future scary possibilities because of what's happening right now. I talked to as many residents that would be affected, their properties be affected along there. I fin finally talked to 10. Out of all 10 that I was able to speak with, all 10, no, 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 I don't want that behind me. They're terrified of what they could, what could happen you know, because of what's happening right now. Currently, right now, you have code enforcement that is aware of issues, not following their rules, not enforcing the code. Why is that? Why would code enforcement not do their job? I don't know. They've known about it for two years. Who in the city is telling them not to do their job? You know, I mean, <laughs> is it the city manager? Is it a commissioner? Because in the past, when this happened, Al Jaquette was telling the code enforcement what to do and what not to do. So we, we've seen this type of thing happen before in our neighborhood where code's not doing their job or another city department's not doing their job. What's happening now? This has been going on almost two years now. I mean, even county animal services have been involved in this and written uh, violations and code violations. What's going on? Just as an example, which I haven't seen mentioned, these are two separate police reports. Now, a neighbor can complain about dogs barking, and then it's, uh, you know, conjecture of whether they're telling the truth or not. These are police reports with your own police stating that they, what they see and hear. Thank you. Thank you. And I, can I, there's five of these for each of you. You can hand it to the clerk, Madam Clerk. Thank you. There's one for everybody. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Hi there, my name is Jennifer and I'm the owner of Beach Dog at 820 Southeast 5th Avenue. Yes, there have been some police reports and the police reports are documented. They haven't heard any barking. So I don't know why he did that. Um, as far as dogs barking towards the east of our building, could be, it's a 5,200 square foot building. We don't use our second warehouse specifically so we don't upset our neighbors, which is 2,500 square feet. Um, the dogs that this is not a kennel. The dogs that come to Beach Dog are very. So um, we're we're gonna we, we have to stick with just the ordinance, which is just about whether or not we're going to you know agree to the ordinance, not specific to your. Great, thank you. Got it. I welcome any of you to come by Beach Dog at night, at any time, and observe it for yourself. End of discussion. Thank you. What else? Um, this is Jen Grasso. I live at 235 Northeast 1st Street. Um, I am a happy owner of a very handsome rescue dog who's extremely active. 
And this is a little on high anxiety side. Having facilities in Delray Beach that afford us to do um, daycare, boarding, and backyards is incredibly invaluable to dog owners. As a dog owner, um, not all dogs are meant for dog parks, and not all dog owner parents are responsible dog park owners when you bring a dog there. They also don't protect from disease, which is prevalent in the areas. So having facilities in Delray Beach that offer these services is actually invaluable, in particular if you live in a condo or an apartment where you don't have a backyard or a place to allow your dog to run on a full-time basis. Boarding our dogs, we all have different reasons we travel. I, I, my partner is disabled when he gets hospitalized on an emergency basis. Having a place that I can safely bring my dog, knowing that he's not going to get sick, is very important. The other issue is having a variety of places that provide this service is also really important. You can take someone like, you know, to use names, a pet smart. The dogs are safe and well cared for, but it's an institutional setting. You know, some of us like to travel and stay at a Ritz-Carlton, some of us like RVs, some of us like to camp in the backyard. Our dogs have different personalities and they behave differently. My dog doesn't do well in an institutional setting. He does well in a small boutique setting. And I think that's important. You know, in part, I moved to Delray because it's a dog-friendly town. My dog is an important part of our family. You know, so not to provide the services that are in this rule would be, to me, unconscionable. I'm going to go to another town to do this. I really want to do this in my own backyard, and I want to support the businesses in my own backyard. So the changes make a lot of sense, including all the elements of it, of the, the, the daycare, the backyards, and the boarding facilities. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, public comment is closed. <clears throat> And it would be to the commission if there's any questions, and then otherwise we'll just um, entertain a motion. I. <clears throat> reading. Yes. It's just first reading, motion but. To approve. Second. Okay. Let, can I may I ask a question um, sure. first? Um, is there uh, is this there was a there was a concern about there being um, no conditional use if there is no backyard or no outdoor space? Is that correct with this? Hi, Anthea Daniotis, Development Services Director. Um, I'm not going to give you a full presentation. I'm just going to try to find a chart yep, <laughs> really sure. quickly. Um, so the importance is that it is distinguishing. Currently, the, we only have kennels defined in veterinary clinics. Mm -hmm. So everything else that's emerged in the pet industry in the last you know, 10, 20 years isn't represented. So it depends on the district that you're in and whether you have outdoor use, if it's conditional use. Since this went to planning board, we have heard more and more that the outside use isn't the only impact raising concern, and that it really is any boarding that's happening overnight, even if it's confined to the inside, needs a conditional use. To, so that's basically the biggest comment that has been coming forward, which I think is kind of what you've heard a little yeah. bit today. Right. Um, currently, it, it, it was following some uses were conditional uses depending on, you know, if they were in an industrial district versus in a more mixed district. So that's something we'll look at based on the feedback we heard. Okay. So, so if we are to um, agree to this, then what you're saying is, is like if there are certain boarding, uh, dog boarding areas now, it would be non-conditional use unless it has an outdoor space? So I mean, I know the areas you're saying. Okay, it's, so there's a distinction between legally established um, establishments and those that weren't. Um, and then there's, so what the code distinguishes between our pet hotels, which keep the board dogs overnight, um, and shelters, which would also fall into that area, animal shelters. Um, and whether those have an outside use or an inside use, and then there's pet services like grooming, training, and if they do or don't have an outside use, how we're handling this. I think the feedback we're getting is that it's not just about whether there's an outside use, it's the length of boarding and how soundproof the buildings are. So while we've tiered it with permitted uses, for example, in GC, if you have a dog groomer, which would fall under pet services and you don't have an outside area, it would just be permitted and not conditional. 
we've already got dog grooming has been interpreted over the years to be a professional service so this is consistent with what's in the code now um, the only change we were proposing to those came out of historic preservation board which for the oshad district wanted to move those to conditional um, pet hotels and shelters that don't have outdoor uses um, the only thing we have in the code that guides us to that is kennels they are only allowed all the way over here in our industrial districts and so there was the comment you heard from some of the Osceola Parks. The current draft shows those uses as permitted if they're not outside. And they're raising the concern that they can still hear the dogs inside. And there are two police reports that were already on your dais related to complaints about barking dogs. So, so could we change that to conditional? That could, all of these uses could go to conditional. Conversely, we've also heard the opposite about veterinary clinics. You've heard multiple conditional uses for veterinary clinics that are tightly regulated, run by you know, medical professionals, and, and there's some concern like, why are we running them through conditional use when they have certain other standards of practice that kind of keep them, mm -hmm. so maybe loosen veterinary and mm -hmm. then you know, maybe tighten up on anything with even just daytime boarding. So okay, these so are the different comments we've heard outside of the, the, the outpouring of support for one particular business, you know, just if we're looking at the use objectively. Um, so, so we could change some of those to conditional use. If okay, so I know that we've got a, a, a motion in a second. Um, I couldn't support it unless we do change those. Um, that's, that's kind right. of how I feel about it. But I don't know where I, my colleagues are. And, I, and maybe we can do it next time, but I'm thinking that on our second read, we really want to be closer to what there, we're going to be. If there's consensus, we would want it now. Yes. Because then we can give you what it's going to look like right. at the second reading. Yeah, I, that's what I was going to say. It's going to make it easier. So I would want to see the commit conditional uses yes. in those areas. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, this is a very contentious uh, issue. And unfortunately, those who might be adjacent to a facility and may not be able to tolerate the sounds of more than one barking barking animal feel as if they have no uh, no recourse and it appears that this is something that nobody wants to tackle i i don't quite understand everything that's in this ordinance or change or whatever but again i've used this more than once that our meetings tend to have a theme and this is a theme of location, location, location. Now, who was there first? Was it the kennel or the doggy daycare or just the facility, the veterinarian, whatever, whoever? If you congregate any number of animals that may change on a daily basis, wherein you have a barker one day and two or three barkers the next day, if the homeowner is not able to tolerate it and they have provided no type of screening or noise abatement. I'm a little, I don't know if this would be the place where we should have had um, the county animal control. I think uh, Anthea mentioned someone who said, you don't have a sound barrier. You, that would make common sense to me. How could you have this kind of an operation without a sound barrier? At least some consideration for the community. So I don't know if I'm supposed to vote yes on this or no on this. There definitely does seem to be a need for thorough discussion. I don't know if it's now or later. Mayor. Yes. Can I make a recommendation? Absolutely. I think the nice thing about um, making something a conditional use is that even though it brings a lot more applications before you, you can look at each one individually and right. tailor the conditions. That's what the vice mayor is looking for. So I think if that's the concern, and I think it's very valid, you know, being behind a residential neighborhood versus being on federal where you have a large piece of property with buffers, I think the commission should look at those two locations differently. So, okay. you know, I, I think from what I'm hearing is that it should probably be a conditional use. You've seen the veterinary clinics, and I think those are routinely granted. That one you might want to accept out of this, and then everyone else would just, you know, essentially be something that comes before you. If we keep seeing the same types of things in the same residential zones or the same zones, then that's something that you can always reconsider and look at again. Okay, my concern also is uh, on veterinary clinics. Um, are we now going into an area where everybody becomes a veterinary clinic, or is there something that specifically makes a veterinary clinic very different from what somebody could just propose to be? 
Um, I would have to look at the definition of it. I mean, we can we can make the definition stronger so that somebody can just, I, I don't think you can name yourself a veterinary clinic. I think it would have to be run by a veterinarian. No, but if they, they, there's, there's a veterinarian that's right. part of the organization and it's really a, a, a daycare, you understand what I'm saying? So, and, so and there are I almost feel like you might want to just leave it that way because right. again, it's not going to make a difference. You know, um, we, we would be approving it. I know right. it's more coming through, but I just worry about the system being gamed. Potentially we end up going yes. in that okay. direction. So you want to amend the? Um, I'll amend with your uh, recommendation. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm voting yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Very good. So we'll be seeing this again as a second read with some of the alterations. Thank you very much. Um, we have no first readings, and we are now at the comments and inquiries of non-agenda items by city manager first. Yes, ma'am, Madam Mayor, Council Member, uh, Commissioners, thank you. Two brief updates I'd like to offer based on direction and discussion since I've been on board the last couple of weeks. First of all, I'm very pleased to report that the city of Delray Beach became successful in reaching its first collective bargaining agreement modification or provision relative to the recently introduced employee COVID-19 vaccination and testing initiative. And this is the International Association of Firefighters chapter. Likewise, I wish to offer my public appreciation to Director of Human Resources, Dane, Dwayne DeAndrea, City Attorney Lynn Jellen, as well as Greg Mahoney, who is the president of the Professional Firefighters of Delray Beach for their collaborative work in helping us to achieve this milestone. All involved are now looking forward to this example being followed by the local chapters of the PBA and SEIU. So that's a tremendous outcome. We're really proud of that. And again, this is the sort of collaboration that I think we all should be proud of and achieving a milestone and a step in the right direction in that regard. Secondly, given the interest and direction offered during last week's meeting regarding an ancillary hazard pay program for employees who had been experiencing direct contact or the potential thereof during the height of the pandemic prospectively. I was able to visit with all involved in terms of reviewing these types of considerations and we are still in the process of developing a solid structured program. However, it has been revealed that legally it would be a bit of a challenge to incorporate the piece or the criteria relative to vaccinations. Likewise, it needs to simply be the administration of a straight hazard pay program, much like having been the case in other municipalities throughout the country. Silly Attorney Lynn Jellen, if you would please, just to offer some additional clarity as to why that position has to be executed, otherwise that's where we are. So the concern was um, when you start limiting the, the incentive to a select group of employees, you run the risk of running afoul of discrimination laws and things like that. So, you know, obviously you don't want to turn something that's a benefit into something that um, creates litigation. So that was a concern with that. Um, in addition, you know, in, in speaking with the city manager, you, the other issue was you don't want to de-incentivize the other employees, you mm -hmm. know, specifically those that feel that, you know, they're not getting some type of reward for, for getting right. themselves vaccinated. And so essentially what we felt was that it would negate Sure. what we're already doing and we certainly don't want to do that because we have made some great progress so in reviewing um you know some non-discrimination laws and things like that my opinion to mr um mr moore was that it should either be straight hazard pay or straight and you know a vaccine incentive but to mix the two together you know as well intentioned as that is i think it just creates additional layers of hurdles for the city Can I ask a question if we make it hazard pay how have we di dictated who's receiving it? I mean, there are departments, there, Anthea's department was in full time during that time functioning, and you could argue, well, she wasn't out on the street, they were protected, but they were working in there in close quarters. There were other departments working as well. Madam S Commissioner Cassell, I'd like to have the opportunity to continue to evaluate those considerations right. because Thank that you. all needs to be taken into account right. as we offer respective follow-up so that's part of the mix of where we're involved and likewise that is to be taken under consideration so we are still in the midst of developing a program 
Okay, thank you. So we have given you a line item of $90,000 from what I understand, is that correct, um, to do this? To, did we not do that the last time? Consensus was offered to proceed along right. those lines. So I would leave it up to you to figure out, and, and obviously the legal team to figure out what makes sense, and I, I support it, whatever it is. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I want to get back to, I mean, there was a defined term, ancillary essential employees, and Ms. Alvarez and uh, Ms. Jellen, you guys identified that group at 180 people. That's how we got to the 90,000. Um, so I'm hoping this isn't going to be delayed any further and that we can move forward on this. Understood. Um, these are the individuals that were, that were out in our community that did have to show up, that did not have an option to work from home. Um, and, um, and it's really important that we show them right now, right now, you know, what they mean to us and everything they've been through. They've had a rough, rough time, and I've met with many of them. Ms. Jellen, how did you understand that, if you will? The, the conversation was, and mm -hmm. I didn't define the employees. I don't know who would cover in that group. My understanding is I guess it would be the SEIU employees, essentially, and maybe some parks maintenance. Um, but it's um, ancillary um, ancillary essential employees. So essentially, essential employees are defined as police and fire. Those are your essential employees. Mm -hmm. So these are the ancillary groups that the understanding, I guess, is that police and fire did receive a, a $1,000 payment from the government. These employees were not included in that group. Ladies and gentlemen, otherwise, to the point of Commissioner Boylston, I'd like to have the opportunity to sure. wrap it up and tighten it up right. clearly and definitively. And my interest this evening was to simply offer you all that piece of the update because we did take that guidance seriously. and. We will move forward accordingly. So please give us the opportunity to take care of the particulars and we'll offer direction accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. I yield, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. City Attorney. Thank you. So I did email you earlier, I don't know if it was this week, last week, um, a conservation, an email entitled Conservation Easement. So we have been approached by a family um, that owns three lots on Palm Trail. Um, the lots are currently undeveloped, um, essentially in their wild state, and they would like to donate those lots to the city. I had a conversation with the family attorney. Um, they're very excited to, you know, give the city this donation. Obviously, it, we haven't hammered out the details because I wanted to speak to the commission first, make sure that there was consensus to move forward. But essentially, um, the property would be kept in its natural state. There would be no opportunity to develop it, and if the city did develop it, um, it would revert back to either a conservation organization or to the family. We haven't, you know, ironed out those details yet. Um, so they're very excited to move forward with this, but I did explain to the family that I would have to get consensus from my bosses before we started moving forward. Could I ask you a question? When you say their st current state or their state, can you make them a park? I mean, does that mean green versus developed with a building? I think they're marshy, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. so basically, <laughs> it just sounded less attractive. No, you know, I think this is like a natural. It's, it's very natural. It, it's, it reminds me of that landlocked parcel that was donated to the city. Um, it reminds me of that kind of property. And so, but this is on Palm Trail. You, you know, when you look at the property appraiser, it, it does have a very high value. And it's, it's a generous, um, thoughtful yes. gift that um, the family wanted to relate to the city. I believe they did email the commission. Um, and so I promised the attorney that I would bring it up this evening. And if there is consensus to move forward, we would make an agenda item. We would need to do, you know, some steps right. for that. Um, so we I, have two I, thumbs up. I, I, well, I have, I have some concerns just because I know we take on a lot of times things that we don't understand what that's actually going to mean in tax dollars later down the, the road. Um, I just want to make sure that we're not taking on something that all of a sudden is a another area that we have to uh, put a front against, uh, you know, um, flooding, things like that. Because again, uh, I, I love the idea of taking on, you know, a, a, you know, a natural setting, but is, are we really the right uh, group to do that? Um, you know, I just worry that we might be taking on something that's going to actually eat into tax dollars that would be utilized or could be utilized elsewhere in doing this. They have spoken with a conservation, um, a non-for-profit that they also considered if the city were to decline the request. Um, 
Now, as far as the property goes, you know, whenever the city takes over additional property, you know, you're always going to have the concern of also assuming some liability also. If, right. God forbid, somebody got hurt or something like that. In addition, as you know, we and we see it, people who don't understand that something must be kept in a current state will, you know, inevitably do tend to come to complain that the city is not maintaining property. Correct. You know, unfortunately, we even had a code issue from, from the last one from the county. So, you know, there are things that you know, also come along with a very generous gift. Hmm. So, um, you know, I'm happy to look into it further, you know, prepare I would, I would just like for you to just find out if there is a, a conservation organization that actually would be better suited for it, that actually can, you know, I mean, it might be a great place to start making sure that the grasses along the edge there are growing for the, the you know, the manatees that aren't getting enough food because there's no place for them to feed along the intercoastal any longer, the, the seagrasses. I, I don't know, but I know that's not our thing. So I just question whether or not we're the right group. Again, like I said, I, I like to hold on to anything that we can, but if there's a, a, a better you know, group that can actually work with the land and make sure that it functions to its best level for for the for the um, you know the for na for na nature, I, I would pres prefer that over something that we're unfamiliar with and then have to maintain. I don't know. I'm I'm in favor if if after we we take ownership and accept accept this gift, which you know we don't get to acquire land too often uh, in Delray Beach, and there's not only so much green space left, then we can talk about partnerships or what we're going to do with it. But I, I I would be in favor of moving forward. Right, but you're saying we can't do anything with it. Current state, it doesn't sound. Um, can we just look into it and see? Could you let us know what the downsides could potentially be, and then maybe in the meantime, I'll fair. And then, it. and then I'll yeah. join. I'll join. You know, I mean, because again, I don't have a problem with it, but I just want to make sure that we're know what we're taking on. Understood. I didn't want to invest staff time, yeah. you know, into something that the commission didn't show any interest in. Um, Definitely have an interest, but yeah. okay. So, so we'll look into it, and then we'll prepare something for you, M Vice Mayor. I I echo. If you need a third, I've, I've lost count as to who's saying what. I think we have it. Um, I think we're. I, I'm I'm interested in it. Yes. Okay. Very good. Well, it looks like you have pretty much consensus to move forward with with maybe some questions asked. Okay. So right. we'll, we'll, we'll prepare something for, the con, uh, for your consideration. Bill? Thank them. Please. Yes. I'm sorry? Thank said, them. And thank them, please. I will. Um, well, this next thing, um, the, the lawsuit of Lozier versus City of Delray Beach is moving forward to trial. I received a few orders from the court setting some pretrial motions for hearing, so I think we may go this trial period. Um, that being said, I do want our outside counsel to speak to you, um, let you know the status of the case. We do have an offer out there. I don't believe that there's consensus to accept it, but you know we do need to put it on the record. So if you don't mind just looking at your calendars, if you can look at September 9th and 10th um, in the afternoon, either September 9th at 3.30 or September 10th, which I think is a Friday at noon, um, we, uh, you know, right. we can, we can do either. a shade meeting. Either. Yeah. I'm unavailable both days. You're not available? Yeah, I'm gonna be out of town. Can you appear telephonically? Probably. I can do Thursday. Thursday at 3.30? Mm -hmm. I can do either. Friday I'll be flying back, so. Okay, so why don't we Thursday. do, well, okay, so um, I'm requesting a shade meeting in the matter of Mark Lozier versus City of Delray Beach, which is 502019CA005557, um, to discuss uh, litigation strategy as well as a proposal for settlement. The shade meeting would be held at the city commission chambers um, on September 9th at 3.30. Those in attendance would be Mayor Shelley Petrolia, Vice Mayor Shirley Johnson, Deputy Vice Mayor Adam Frankel, Commissioner Ryan Bolson, Commissioner Julie Cassell, City Manager Terrence Moore, myself, uh, Lynn Jellin, City Attorney, Outside Counsel Brett Schneider, and Outside Counsel Porpoise Evans. Um, and if I could just get a motion and a second, that would be great. Second. Call the roll, please. Second. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. The certified court reporter. All right, I'm done. Okay, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to the commission? Anybody want to start? Yeah, yeah, I can start. All right, I'm going to just use all my time just to reference uh, this evening's hot topic. Um, and I wore my, my new Ted Lasso socks to keep it positive. If you don't know that reference, it's a great show. Um, 
but I do want to keep it. I do want to keep it positive. So to Delray Beach, keep your head up, and know that I know old school square. What makes it special is not the buildings, but what's in the buildings. I know what makes our village special is not the buildings, but it's the people in the village. And from all the stories that I've heard and got to see a little bit, you know, as I was younger, um, this is where we shine. This is where the village comes out, right? And we huddle together, we work together, we collaborate, and we come out stronger than ever. So I look forward to being part of one of those amazing stories that started last Tuesday. Um, and just to my, to my colleagues, I think probably the areas that we've been most successful, the times we've been most successful has been on hot topics that have been taken, um, that has been handled well. And I would say the sea grapes was a good example, really hot topic. It was workshopped, it was talked about. City staff did walking tours to educate people. We leaned into partners like the Beach Properties Owners Association. And regardless of what side of that vote you were on, right? It was accepted by most of the community because they were educated on it and they understood both sides of a very difficult decision. I think paid parking was similar. The investment to bring in a speaker, the partnerships with the DDA, right? It, that was like two years of educating our community on that there is no free parking. It took a long time and then we made that decision. Now I think that was another 3-2 vote, right? But everyone understood it and because it was understood, it was accepted. Right? Those are two hot topics that once they happened, once things were trimmed and, uh, and paid parking went in place, it actually went pretty smoothly for how hot those topics were. If we could handle topics, large, large topics like that more often, I think it would be a good idea. And when we misstep, we listen to the community. I misstepped this year. I, may, I, you know, I, I asked for an agenda item where we were going to take two public CRA board members off. I heard from the community. I stepped right back and said, you know what? I pull back my support for that item. I didn't even want it on the agenda. Didn't even need the public comment. Just the community reaching out to me that week, I pulled back. And most recently, the green building ordinance. I came in hot and ready to move. But I'm really, really happy with the conversations that I've had since with some of the architects that came in. Some of the people from our community, including the DDA, including private uh, citizens that have reached out to me and said, I want to be part of that. I heard you doing a public meeting to talk about green, green building. I want to be part of that. That's exciting. And I'm hoping that moving forward, we could take that approach, and these are four really good examples, we can take that approach moving forward together. Um, and regardless of how the vote turns out, Hopefully, the community will understand and they'll be bought in to our decision, even if they don't agree with it. Right. May I, may I follow that? Um, wait, are you finished then? Yes. That's it. That's oh, all I, did. I got sure, the distinct go right impression he was. I agree with you. I really do, 100%. And I know what you're saying about the feeling you want to have after a vote. And at the last meeting, I recommended, and look, there are some facts that we can't deny sitting up here. And Ryan, you agree, they're not in compliance, right? And they haven't been in a, in a, a long time. And we got the update today, and it's probably worse than we thought in terms of the compliance if you review the documentation that hasn't been provided. So at the last meeting, when I had said, maybe we give them 180 day notice, and we see what happens, I fully anticipated they would leave this building and get it together. And instead, in two days, they personally attacked Ms. Johnson. They basically were sending out emails saying, we are in compliance, which is factually inaccurate. You don't deny that, right? Right? I mean, they're not in compliance. So when they emailed and said, well, you know that. Do you, you, we all know that. We, got in, we know that. You know they're not in compliance. You just said they're not. They're not in compliance. They're not in compliance. Okay. They in compliance? Your words, not mine. I, no, I don't it, want to but, define compliance. I, mean, I don't know what that is. Like it is submitting the documentation required by the city. By That's the, compliance. By the city lease? The CRA and to the city. The documents. Not the CRA. That's no, no, no. The, the requirements are in the lease. You know it and I know it. They're not in compliance. We assigned an auditor 
as a result of that, I anticipated, going back to the positive, let's keep it positive, you said, I thought they were gonna walk away and try and figure out a workable arrangement because they were talking about, we haven't felt like good partners, we haven't felt that it was great. And, and frankly, the response was shocking to me. And honestly, Mr. Porton, whom I really like, said no one met with them. I met with him. I met with Miss Borg. I met with Deborah Dowd. Twice I toured the uh, facility with her and I went to the Achievement Center. I sat down and, and, and sat with uh, Scott and I, I was very clear that compliance is critically important. So frankly, I do feel like this is not a great situation, but I'm also remarkably disappointed in the reaction because I would never have handled it that way. I would have tried to show we're going to figure out a way to get in compliance. We're going to figure out a way to be a good partner. We want to work with the city. And that's not the impression that I got from the reaction. And that's totally disappointing to me. And you know, Ms. Simon, you said we need to work together. This, that didn't feel like working together. And the lack of compliance doesn't feel like working together. I think there's a perception issue there. Um, you state that you gave them 180 days. I would have been in favor of giving them 180 days. That's not what we did. We fired them. We terminated them. We gave so them notice. That's like going to someone that works for you, firing them, and then saying, work here for another 180 days. Eh, maybe I'll rehire you. Ms. Jellin was very clear that that is not what we did last Tuesday, that we were terminating them, that there was no turnaround. This was not 100 days. If you had made a motion, 180 I tried days to, to get your actually. act together. I tried to, and we were told it was that we should really just stick to doing one thing or doing the other. I brought it up last week. Oh, you could have easily voted. This is how it works. You could easily voted against the motion that was made on the floor and then made your own motion. Well, I, I think if you go back and watch, I was discussing letting them know that they had 180 days and then seeing what they did in the meantime. You can watch the meeting. It, oh, I, our, exactly our attorney the said you can't do that. No, no, no. And then I yeah, voted to terminate. A message that That's says correct. You're fired. But work here for 180 days more. Maybe I'll rehire you. It, it, instead, you could have put them on probation for. 100 I feel days. like they've been on probation for a long time. We've gone to. No. We've had three meetings on this subject. I mean, it's not this idea that people are shocked and surprised. Shocks and surprises me. Really. I would probably. Okay, well, I, I don't think we're going to agree on this. Okay. No, I, I would um, probably say let's so. let's stop this because I, okay. I don't know where no, we're no, going. No, no, no. I'm this. trying to agree with him in the sense that working together is critically important. But you. You have to feel that partnership, you know, it has to feel like it's working together. And I'm just saying from my perspective, I'm the newest person here. I, it, it's not the feeling that I, that I got based on the actions. Any comments other than that? Well, hopefully you did oh, thank take you. note of Mr. Frankel and, and I, I did. Um, last week, right? And we weren't on Facebook. We weren't sending emails out to, to anyone in regards to the decision. I mean, with the sea grapes, I was photoshopped with an ax in my hand. Um, but I didn't so do that. I can't account I know for what didn't. other people I know you do. Didn't, but I, I'm always polite. You mentioned that this last week some people didn't react like you'd hope. But hopefully, as your colleagues, you know, we, right. we, we did. I'll always be respectful to you and your decision. Do you have any other comments? No, thank you. Okay, very good. Up to me? Yep. My turn, Mayor. No, oh, hold on. Let me let me, let the Deputy that. Vice Mayor go, and right. then we'll have you. Well, it's okay. The way I see it, I, I've, I've looked at the last year and a half. We've had a difficult time as a city, as a state, as a county, as a country, during a pandemic that seems to never want to end. And as a city, and I, Mr. Moore, hopefully uh, you were briefed, I'm sure you have been, because I'm sure you had similar issues uh, in that fine town in Georgia where you came from. This city went beyond to assist those businesses and those individuals in any which way we could. I'm also reminded of a history of a certain arts garage. And Laura, you remember when there was all kinds of accusations of misappropriation and the CEO was doing terrible things and the board, horrible thing. What, what did we do as a city? We got together, we remedied it, we fixed it, and it's thriving now. This, in my view, is a shining example of what could be done now. I don't fault the reaction of anyone. 
I agree with these statements, and I've stated publicly, not only in this chair, but also to my friend at Channel 5 or the Palm Beach Post or anyone who's asked me, is Old School Square perfectly in compliance? Absolutely not. Now, why aren't they in compliance? Well, one thing you can look at is the contract that they were forced to sign five years ago. Am I right about that, Lynn? Five, six years ago. I would just take exception to the word forced. <laughs> well, no, I, well, I'll say forced, but uh, they <laughs> entered into there, But I mean, that would, you know, that's kind of a strong word. Well, and it is a strong word, and, and I stand by it. And uh, if anyone wants to correct me, they can uh, see fit. But the fact is this. It was almost as if they were set up to fail. Uh, and in conversations I've had with our city attorney, I don't think she disagrees with that assertion that I'm making. Now, what could be done? Well, as it stands right now, good night and good luck. <laughs> we got 180 days. We'll see what they have on the books and what goes forward. And then there's going to be a period. Good luck. And I find it troublesome, and I think that the 100-plus people in the audience today and the 6,000 or who knows how many people who signed that petition, I think they feel similarly. And here's what I saw today. And Madam Clerk, you can tell me if, if I'm wrong. I haven't heard any comments today, emailed otherwise, uh, that states they're happy with what occurred last week. I'm not happy with what occurred. I respect it. Uh, anytime there's a majority decision, uh, while I don't necessarily agree with it, I respect it. However, in my view, the process was terrible. And I, I met with Mr. Moore earlier today, and we spoke about the statement that came from his office. And the one word that uh, came out in his statement that we discussed was transparency. There's been nothing transparent of what occurred last week, period, in my view. There was nothing that uh, allowed a trial to occur ex parte with the other party, put on notice, uh, with a potential severing of a 30-year relationship. To me, that just doesn't sound right. Uh, so hopefully some of those individuals that were here at 4 o'clock are still watching. And uh, I appreciate the fact that they've called, emailed, uh, although I don't appreciate the private numbers of any of us given out, and I have publicly stated that to those individuals. That was wrong uh, to do that for all five of us, for the record. But it's real simple. A person on the prevailing side can do a motion to reconsider. You have a few moments to do that. If one of the individuals do not wish to do so, I'll respect it. We'll figure it out. And uh, Mr. Boylston, I appreciate the comments that you stated uh, in your comments tonight. There's a way to fix it. There's a way to require a new contract with other demands. There's a way for the audit to finish and allow them to, to fix the neglect that is out there when I agree with you, Ms. Cassell. There can be an agreement to be made to uh, change management or board members or what. There's plenty of options. But as one of the, uh, the speakers said a couple hours ago, right now we're at the nuclear option. If that's what you want to do. You want to blow up something that a lot of people contributed hours of volunteer time and millions of dollars. That's fine. I disagree with the decision, but to me, we only have a couple more minutes to potentially remedy it. That's it. Thank Thanks. you. Vice Mayor? Well, thank you very much, Mayor. I, um, I'm, I'm really disturbed because it appears that this is a so difficult situation. And everyone has a side. And unfortunately, transparency is not always available when you are entering into this kind of a situation. And I don't know when it occurred that every time there is a decision that needs to be made by the commission, we must go before the public and say, will you agree to this? They did that when they voted for us, in my opinion. And there are remedies if anybody wants to recall any of us, then they can do it. But this particular case has been going on, as I have stated before, since
since I was elected in 2017. Now, uh, Vice Deputy Mayor Franco, I did hear from people who did not and are afraid to voice their opinions in the public. I'd be happy to send you their emails if you would like. I can't send you their telephone calls, but there are many people who agree with the decision that was made, but they're not going to come forward because of the uh, reaction that I'm sure they would have rained upon their heads as has been rained upon some of our heads. So since we're under litigation, I won't go any further. There's obviously other things I can say and will say when the time is appropriate. But if we must go before the residents to get their approval on a fiduciary requirement by the elected officials, then everything is going to come to a halt because we do business all the time without clearing it with the residents. Thank you. Anything Shelly, else? Any other comments record? from uh, other than that, uh, so that we're not in Vice Mayor? Oh, and I could be corrected. We're not in litigation. Did not the attorney uh, Jellen say we were in litigation? No, no. Did I misunderstand something? There's no, we have not been served with a lawsuit. There's a notice of intent to sue that was sent to the commission, I believe, last week. And I believe that anything we say from now on in will be used once they do decide to, should they not prevail, they, their intent is to sue us. Am I correct? Is that what the notice is all about? If you don't let us stay, we will sue you? I don't know if it's stated that Am I missing something? Am I missing Typically Am I missing before, something? I'm sorry. Typically before a lawsuit is filed, um, there may be statutory requirements or just other requirements that require a notice of intent. I think the basis for that was to preserve any evidence that may exist, which obviously everything that we do is a public record, so that's not a concern. But that, that's, that's actually almost like a form letter that's filed um, before, before any litigation, typically. So that anything that's said tonight is not something that they can then use against us? I think anything that you say publicly and writing verbally can always be used against you. So, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know if tonight's Thank specific you. to anything, but I, I think anything can always be used against you. Um, but, you know, I, I'm always cautious, and I would always advise you that your comments should be um, carefully worded so that we don't create uh, or make a situation worse. Thank you. So in order to follow your instructions or your kind words as to how we should conduct ourselves, I do not anticipate that anything anyone does come henceforth and forever with this organization as it is now made up. And correct me also, uh, Attorney Jellen, do we have the right to dictate to this nonprofit who serves on their board? Who their elect, who their nom, who their appointed um, executive uh, positions holders are. Um, I don't think that's in the no. contract. I, I would say typically no. Um, however, I can tell you that in conversations with um, individuals from Old School Square, you know, I, I do believe they had referenced that and potentially doing that if that was truly the concern of the commission. So. You know, I think, you know, I would, I would be cautious to, to ask my commission to dictate those types of things, but I think that if they proffer that in an effort to try to settle the differences, you know, if it's coming from them, I think you could accept it, but I, I don't think you could typically dictate it. I, I, I don't even choose to go there because we don't do it with the other nonprofits, and that's my concern. I don't choose to create, create I'm sorry, treat any one nonprofit differently from the other. And that's what I believe we've been doing with this particular one since I've been on board. So I have no further comment. I have no intentions of changing whatever I have said, and I will stand by it. And anything that I can say publicly without having something go on the record that can be used against me. And uh, as far as all of the attacks that have been rained on my head, you don't know what you don't know. Thank you. Thank and everyone, you. I appreciate your allowing me 
to conduct both meetings uh, via the telephone. It has been my privilege to serve, and I intend to continue to do that. And uh, look forward to seeing all of you, and I wish I were there. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, could I just add one thing? I also got some uh, mail as, and, as did and I. phone calls. I mean, I, I, I think that there is hesitation to come out because of the litigious uh, nature of what we've been dealing with. I have gotten um, people calling me, telling me the same thing, that we are on the right track and that this has been a problem for a while from people who have inside information and also those that have been long members of our community um, that have watched you know, over the years. So I'm sorry that they're not sharing with everybody, but um, those that I think mm -hmm. stepped out and were bold, um, are those are the ones that they're sharing with. Um, as to the arts garage, yes, we fixed it. We fixed it by changing management. And um, mm -hmm. we're, back, we're back to that issue again. There is a broken system. And yes, uh, we, we are, I look in the mirror every day and I say we have had the same issues, but we have done everything that we could to fix it. And I think that we have. Thank you, Mr. Moore, for joining us. Um, so I, I, I believe that, you know, that's, that's what we do when we find something that's wrong. We don't ignore it. We try to fix it. And that's what happened with the arts garage. And that's what needs to happen at, at Old School Square, from my perspective. Um, I wanted to thank Mr. Moore also for his update. Um, it was as comprehensive an update as, as I've ever received, inclusive of all of your time and who you're meeting with in City Hall. I mean, that is going above and beyond. And I thank you, sir, because if you want to talk about transparency, there it is, right there. Inclusive of your days that you've been coming in on Saturdays to help straighten our organization out. I thank you for that. Thank you. And if I may, Madam Mayor, mm -hmm. for the record, what Madam Mayor is referring to is the weekly City Commission Correct. information letter, which is every Friday, unless noted. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, I also want to thank you for leading us down the positive road of dealing with COVID within our organization. That takes true strength and leadership to do what you did. And um, I, am, uh, I stand in, in awe of what you came in and did right away. Um, and I also want to thank you for the email that you sent out. And um, I did get a call asking from you to me um, whether or not that was, there was some question as to whether or not the, the letter uh, was correct. And um, I'm bringing it to my colleagues because I think that, uh, you know, there was question as to whether or not it was sent out as, you know, in its, in its, um, in what it said that it was what we intended. And I would have to say, I responded to you immediately. Absolutely. You hit the ball out of the park with that. Um, that um, email. And I would caution my colleagues to allow Mr. Moore to do his job, 100%. Not to be questioning him doing his job. He can send out any email that he wants to send out. That's his job to do. If we have a problem with it, we bring it here amongst ourselves and we talk about it. Because it's not one person that makes that decision. It's the group of us. Just like we made the decision last week, as a group, to terminate Old School Square contract. We don't get to stand on either side. I was already cautioned about that before. Didn't stand on either side when it was, when, when, the, when the sea grapes were hacked down after a big, you know, to-do and, and, and tons of signatures. It got done. I stated my position. I still state that it was not done properly. That's my personal opinion, but you know what? It's a decision that the majority of people, you know, um, on this commission at that time made as far as a decision. So when we're talking about these, these items and we make a decision, it's not about some of the, it's not about some of us up here. It's all of us. And as a matter of fact, the comment that I heard from my colleague, and I just want to mention it, was that he didn't appreciate that all the numbers were put on there as far as our personal numbers. And I would hope that that meant that you wouldn't want any of our numbers. Mm -hmm. To be clear, I said all five. Okay. 
So don't assert anything that I'm I not. Have. I'm not. But well, for the fact, you're but for the allegations, Mayor. No, I'm not making any allegations. It's what you're I heard, and I'm asking the question. I had uh, influence on him sending an email out. I think I absolutely didn't out. say that well, you did. Listen. It's just really odd the way you're talking to us right now. Yes, I'll just say, odd. Mayor, it's really strange. Well, it's really not because I think that you know okay. we we need, to, we need to let the city manager do his job. Okay. And in addition to that, you didn't have two. You didn't have two. You didn't have two emails sent out. The second email that was sent out by old, uh, by old school square was with three personal emails, inclu not including your 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 two. It was the work ones, and I don't agree with that either. And no, I it was three time. personal. It was our personal. Phone? Yeah, there well, was a second I, one that was sent out, but somehow yours were missing, but ours were still on. I'll say personal email should not be given out either. Okay. I I totally agree with you. I just wanted to make sure that we were on the same page with that. I stated that before you. Well, I just mayor, was making it clear. Mayor, mayor, yes, mayor, mayor. May I just, I, I, do not, cannot believe that. We know that if three of us have the same desire to vote a certain way, that that is supposed to be the way it goes. It's a three-two vote, or it's a four-one vote, or it's a five-zero vote. It does not give us the right to go and harangue the city manager because we, you, whoever, was not on the prevailing side of the vote. Who, 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 never who are you talking concerned. about? Who, who I'm reigned? talking about anyone who decides to go to the city manager and harangue him because of a wonderful letter that he wrote in response to what was happening on the dais for the commission when we voted. That's now, I always Mr. say, Mark. if someone squeals when the shoe is thrown, that's the one who did the deed. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, I didn't me. mention anyone's yes. name, Commissioner Boylston. Yes. All I know is I heard that someone approached the city manager and was not happy with it. Obviously, he's experienced enough to know that he's going to poll the commission, and all he needs is three of us he's, to say, go with it. Here's what's funny. If that's what this is all about, the way the mayor was just speaking and the way you're speaking now, Ms. Johnson, I'm wondering how you guys heard the same rumor, because if there's someone in between you telling you this rumor, I'd like Mr. Moore to clarify what our, what our phone call was about on Saturday. No, I I speak to all of you all the time. Sometimes you all call me for I don't feel a ring at all. Basically, is what I wish to say it. That's not the case at all. New to the organization, my interest is to do the absolute best job as possible. And quite honestly, much of that is a function of my I, my sincere and genuine interest to have a great relationship with all five of you all. I think all five of you all are great people. You have your different perspective and your different thoughts. So I feel great to be here, despite some of the the, the inconveniences associated with direction involved. So my interest is to offer steady hand leadership and guidance across the board. So there's no concern or issue with me whatsoever. There's no reason for any of you all to think that there are any problems in that regard whatsoever. Each of you all have the ability to Thank reach you. out to me at any time. You do, I do with you all, period, point blank. So please do not be concerned in that regard. There's no issue or concern to be raised at this time and if it is it's to happen here otherwise i will engage with all five of you all on a frequent and consistent basis mayor you offered compliments regarding my weekly reporting structure please take a look at that i try to communicate with all of you all equally equitable phone calls written material formal informal whatever the case may be so please continue to offer your time if you have a question of any way i will be responsive accordingly Thank you, Mr. Moore. I do Moore. not feel concerned about that whatsoever. Please understand that, all five of you. I look forward to it. And yes, this is a challenging environment, particularly given my short, little over a couple of weeks being on board. But I welcome the opportunity professionally. I see it as an opportunity to execute ideas, leadership, guidance, and direction. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Moore. Moore. And just for the record, Ms. Johnson, the reason I called Mr. Moore is because we've never had a city manager send an email like that to the public. Not that I can We should ever have remember. in many different instances yeah, that we, we have never. Yeah, we yeah. should have. So I gave him a call and I said on Saturday, which you were in the office on Saturday. I was. And I was at Atlantic High School. Atlantic High School. And, yeah, that's right. And we had a really good conversation about it. So I don't know what the issue or where the rumors come from, but. 
I frankly, I appreciate it. I did not call your name. I didn't know anything about a phone call. All I was doing is going along with the mayor saying that once we make a decision, I would hope that we don't try to lobby our new city manager in order to uh, stop him from doing anything. He's a professional. I would just beg that all of us allow him to do his job. And in the two weeks that he's been here, and thank you, Mayor, I didn't want to go on about this, but I am so happy that City Manager Moore is here because he doesn't, I don't think he's intimidated. We've had a few that have been, and there have been behind the scenes, uh, I don't like what you did and I don't like what you are thinking or whatever the situation is. And I would like to have commended him. Everything he's put out, every idea he's suggested and made and bold moves that he's made. I am so happy and I look so fo- I so look forward to working with him. And I just ask my comrade, my uh, colleagues to please give him an opportunity to do his job. Thank you very much. I think that you said it all. Is she there- did. And super quickly, I want to say I appreciate you 100%. And I, I will say that I thought the email um, was appropriate, if you want my insight. Um, and only because what was being challenged was what happened on the dais, not specifically our votes, but the process as potentially unethical, lacking diligence, mm-hmm. and not having proper information. Thank and and in that case, I think that the city responding is not inappropriate. And I thank you for doing that. And uh, thank you all. It's been a lovely evening. Yeah. All right. Uh, meeting adjourned.